Welcome to the Huberman Lab Podcast, where we discuss science and science-based tools for everyday life. I'm Andrew Huberman, and I'm a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine. Today, my guest is Dr. Justin Sonnenberg. Dr. Sonnenberg is a professor of microbiology and immunology at Stanford School of Medicine and one of the world's leading experts on the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is the existence of trillions of little microorganisms throughout your gut. And by your gut, I don't just mean your stomach, I mean your entire digestive tract. Turns out we also have a microbiome that exists in our nose, in any other location in which our body interfaces with the outside world. In fact, there's a microbiome on your skin. And while it might seem kind of intrusive or kind of disgusting to have all these little microorganisms, they can be immensely beneficial for our health meaning our hormonal health, our brain health, and our immune system function. Dr. Sonnenberg teaches us about the gut microbiome, how it's organized spatially, meaning which microbiota live where. He teaches us about these incredible things called crypts and niches, which are little caves within our digestive tract that certain microbiota take residence. And at that premier real estate, they're able to do incredible things to support our health. He also talks about the things that we can all do to support our microbiome in order for our microbiome to support our brain and body health. Dr. Sonnenberg co-runs his laboratory with his spouse, Dr. Erica Sonnenberg, and together they've also written a terrific and highly informative book called The Good Gut, Taking Control of Your Weight, Your Mood, and Your Long-Term Health. Even though that book was written a few years back, the information still holds up very nicely. And today he also builds on that information informing us about recent studies that, for instance, point to the important role of fermented foods and the role of fiber in supporting a healthy gut microbiome. So if you've heard about the gut microbiome, or even if you haven't, today you're going to hear about it from one of the world's leading experts. He makes it immensely clear as to what it is, how it functions, and how to support it for your brain and body health. During today's discussion, we don't just talk about nutrition. We also talk about the impact of behaviors and the microbiome, behaviors such as who you touch, who you kiss, who you hug, whether or not you interact with or avoid animals, whether or not those animals belong to you or whether or not they belong to somebody else. If all that sounds a little bit bizarre, you'll soon understand that your microbiome is constantly being modified by the behavioral interactions, the nutritional interactions, and indeed your mood and internal reactions to the outside world. This is an incredible system. Everyone has one. Everyone should know how it works and everyone should know how to optimize it. And today you're going to learn all of that from Dr. Sonnenberg. I'm pleased to announce that I'm hosting two live events in May, 2022. The first live event will take place in Seattle, Washington on May 17th. The second event will take place in Portland, Oregon on May 18th. Both are part of a series called the Brain Body Contract. For this series, I will discuss science. So I will discuss the mechanistic science around things like sleep and focus and motivation, physical performance, mental health, physical health, a large number of topics that I believe many people are interested in and that certainly are important for our health and well-being and performance. In addition, I will, of course, describe tools and actionable items, most of which I have not discussed on the Huberman Lab podcast or anywhere else. Pre-sale tickets for these two events go live Tuesday, March 8th at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We've made these tickets exclusively available to the listeners of the Huberman Lab podcast, so they are password protected. To find them, you can go to hubermanlab.com slash tour and use the code Huberman. Before we begin, I'd like to emphasize that this podcast is separate from my teaching and research roles at Stanford. It is, however, part of my desire and effort to bring zero cost to consumer information about science and science-related tools to the general public. In keeping with that theme, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's podcast. Our first sponsor is Athletic Greens, now called AG1. I've been taking AG1 since 2012, so I'm delighted that they're sponsoring the podcast. The reason I started taking AG1 and the reason I still take AG1 once or twice a day is that it meets all my basic foundational supplementation needs. What I mean by that is it covers any vitamin and nutritional deficiencies that I might have because I'm trying to be good about my nutrition and diet, but I don't always manage to get everything that I need. And I'm sure that there are a lot of gaps in there. So it covers those gaps. It also has probiotics. And as you'll learn in today's episode, and I've talked about on previous episodes, the probiotics are essential for a healthy gut microbiome. 
We need probiotics in order for our microbiome to thrive and our microbiome supports things like gut brain health, indeed things like metabolism, mood, hunger. It also supports the immune system. As you'll learn today, your gut microbiome actually manufactures neurotransmitters, the very chemicals that impact mood and brain function. Athletic Greens primes your system for a healthy gut microbiome, something that can be achieved with food and lifestyle factors, but is often hard to achieve with just food and lifestyle factors. If you'd like to try Athletic Greens, you can go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman to claim a special offer. They'll give you five free travel packs to make it very easy to mix up Athletic Greens while you're on the road and a year's supply of vitamin D3K2. Vitamin D3 has many important biological functions that support your immediate and long-term health and K2 as well as very important for things like cardiovascular health, calcium regulation, and so on. Again, if you go to athleticgreens.com slash Huberman, you can claim the special offer of the five free travel packs and the vitamin D3 K2. Today's episode is also brought to us by Roka. Roka makes eyeglasses and sunglasses that I believe are of the very highest quality. I've spent my lifetime working on the biology of the visual system. And I can tell you that the biology of the visual system has a lot of mechanisms in there. So that for instance, if you move from a bright environment to a dim environment, your visual system needs to adapt. One issue with a lot of sunglasses and eyeglasses is you move from one environment to the next and you have to take the sunglasses or eyeglasses off. You get a glare or you have to adjust because of the way that the lenses are designed. With Roka, they've taken the biology of the visual system into account. And so you never have to take them off and on in order to move from one environment to the next. They are also designed for movement and athletics, or you can wear them for just things like work and going out to dinner and so forth. They have a terrific aesthetic. They're extremely lightweight. In fact, I often forget that they're even on my face. I wear sunglasses when it's very bright and when I'm driving into sunlight, I wear readers at night. I hardly ever remember that they're on my face. They also won't slip off your face if you use them when running or cycling. The company was developed by two all-American swimmers from Stanford. So everything about these sunglasses and eyeglasses was developed with performance in mind in a lot of different situations and scenarios. If you'd like to try Roka, you can go to roka.com, that's R-O-K-A.com, and enter the code Huberman to save 20% off your first order. Again, that's Roka, R-O-K-A.com, and enter the code Huberman at checkout. Today's episode is also brought to us by Helix Sleep. Helix makes mattresses and pillows that are designed for your particular sleep needs. What I mean by that is you can go to the Helix site, you can take a very brief two or three minute quiz, Ask questions like, do you sleep on your side, your back, your stomach? Do you tend to run hot or cold through the night? Maybe you don't know the answers to those questions. And then they match you to a mattress that's designed for your particular sleep needs. I match to the Dusk, D-U-S-K mattress. I like a mattress that's not too firm, not too soft. I tend to sleep on my side. I sort of in the like crawling soldier position it seems to be the, the most common position I sleep in. And that really works terrifically well for me. But you need to take the quiz to see which mattress works best for you. So if you're interested in upgrading your mattress, go to helixsleep.com slash Huberman, take the two minute quiz and they'll match you to a customized mattress. You can figure out how to get your optimal sleep, which is, I've talked about on this podcast so many times before. Sleep is the foundation of all mental and physical health and performance in any aspect of life. Sleep is key. And the mattress you sleep on is key to the sleep you get. After matching you to a customized mattress, you can get up to $200 off any mattress order and two free pillows. Again, if you're interested, you can go to helixsleep.com slash Huberman to get up to $200 off and two free pillows. And now for my discussion with Dr. Justin Sonnenberg. Justin, thanks so much for being here. Great to be here. Yeah. I am a true novice when it comes to the microbiome. So I'd like to start off with a really basic question, which is what is the microbiome? I imagine lots of little bugs running around in my gut. And I don't quite like the image of that, uh, but I'm aware that our microbiome can be good for us, but we can also have an unhealthy microbiome. So if I were to look at the microbiome at the scale that I could see the meaningful things, what would it look like and what's going on in there? Yeah, I mean, the essentially you're correct. I mean, we have all of these little microorganisms running around in our gut. I think you know, just to start off with clarifying terminology, um, microbiome and microbiota quite often are referred to or used to refer to our microbial community interchangeably. And I'll probably switch between those two terms today. The other important thing to realize is that these microbes are um, not just in our gut, but they're all over our body. They're in our nose, they're in our mouths, they're on our skin. And um, so basically anywhere that the environment can get to, uh, in our body, which includes inside our digestive tract, of course, is, you know, colonized with, with microbes. And 
Um, the <clears throat> vast majority of these are in our distal gut and in our colon. And so this is the gut microbiota or gut microbiome. And um, the <clears throat> density of this community is astounding. I mean, it really is. Uh, um, if you get down to the scale of, um, you know, being able to see individual microbes, uh, you know, you start off with a zoomed out view and you see something that looks like, you know, fecal material that digest inside the, the gut and you zoom in and you start to, you know, get to the microscopic level and see the microbes. They are just packed, you know, side to side, end to end. It's a super dense bacterial community, almost like a um, biofilm, you know, something that's just made up of microbes to the point where um, <clears throat> it's thought that, you know, around 30% of fecal matter is microbes. 30 to 50%. So, you know, it's, um, it's an incredibly dense microbial community. We're talking of, um, you know, uh, trillions of microbial cells and all those microbial cells, if you start to get to know them and, and see who they are, um, break out in the gut probably to um, hundreds to a thousand species, depending upon how you define um, a microbial species. And then <clears throat> most of these are bacteria um, but there are a lot of other life forms there. There are archaea, which are little microbes that are bacteria-like, but they're they're different. Um, there are uh, eukaryotes. So you know, uh, we commonly think of eukaryotes in the gut as um, as you know something like uh, a parasite. But um, there are eukaryotes. There are fungi. There are also little viruses. There are these bacteriophages that infect bacterial cells. And so, um, and, and those actually outnumber the bacteria like 10 to one. So they're just everywhere there. They kill bacteria. Um, and so there's, there's these really interesting predator prey interactions, but, um, overall it's just this really dense, complex, dynamic ecosystem. And, and so, you know, we're, we're talking about the human as a single species, but we're also thinking of the human as this complex integrated ecosystem of, hundreds to thousands of species interacting in concert to do all the fantastic things that we know happen in the human body. Amazing. So we've got a lot of cargo. Uh, to totally. Or maybe we're the cargo. Yeah. Um, who yeah. Knows? yeah. I mean, there, there have been people that have likened um, humans to just a really elaborate culturing flask for microbes and that we've actually been designed over the course of evolution, um, designed to uh, just um, efficiently propagate this microbial culture from person to person, from generation to generation. So it's a different way of thinking of the human body. Interesting. I believe that our uh, pH or the, the pH of our uh, digestive system varies as you descend, as you go from mouth to, you know, to throat and stomach. And you said that most of the uh, microbiota are in the distal colon. Um, are there distinct forms of microbiota all along the length of the, of the digestive tract and within these other um, interfaces with the outside world? Totally, yeah. So it starts like with our teeth and in our mouth and saliva, there's a, a oral microbiota. Um, these microbial species are very different than the ones that you find in the digestive tract. They're um, usually um, you know, built to deal with oxygen very well. They're you know, in an area that ex is exposed to a lot of oxygen. They, of course, see different nutrients than, for instance, a colonic bacteria would see. And they grow quite often in, in mats that live, you know, on teeth. So they're, they're, struc they're very structured in terms of and, um, and not uh, moving around a lot. So they, they're very fairly stationary. As you move down the digestive tract, there are microbes in our esophagus and our stomach. But those are, you know, those communities are, are not very dense and actually not very well studied. We know of a very... Um, you know, there's a very famous stomach bacteria known as Helicobacter pylori, which um, can cause stomach ulcers and cause gastric cancer in some, some um, you know, uh, less frequent situations. But, the, um, you know, this is um, a, a very different, um, different set of microbes. They have to be adapted to a different environment in the stomach, especially incredibly acidic environment, um, but also very different in terms of their ability to interact with other microbes just because the communities are less dense, they're less dynamic, um, there's less nutrients that stay there and passage through the community. So the, a lot of times those communities are reliant upon nutrients derived from the host as opposed to nutrients derived from our diet. 
as you move down out of the stomach into the small intestine, you start to see these communities, which are the ones that are becoming more well studied. Um, small intestine is still a bit of a black box just because it's hard to access. And so there's some really cool technologies out there for using, for instance, capsules to do sampling as the capsule passes through the digestive tract so that we have a better idea of what's going on in the small intestine. And then you get to the colon, and this is the community that's just so incredibly, you know, densely packed, um, doing a ton of, there's a ton of metabolic activity happening there and um, a bunch of interaction with the host. And that's the study, that's the um, community that's really the best studied Part of the reason for that is because stool is so easy to obtain compared to, for instance, something in the stomach or small intestine, and that stool is fairly representative. We know from studies that have been done using colonoscopies and so forth, stool is fairly representative of what's happening in the colon. So um, dense, super exciting community, but also the best study just because it's the, the easiest to access in the lower digestive tract. Very interesting. Uh I imagine these microbiota have to get in there at some point. Uh, are microbiota seen in newborns? Um, in other words, where do they come from? And dare I ask, um, what direction do they enter the body? Yeah. Or, or is it from multiple directions? Yeah, yeah, great question. So, you know, one of the burning questions that we can come back to at the end of this is where does our microbiota come from? Because it is this kind of, you know, existential question in the field, like where where is this community assembling from? And the, the reason that it's such an interesting question is that, um, you know, a fetus, when it's in the womb, it, that's actually a sterile environment. Um, there have been some studies that have looked at um, whether there are microbes in the womb and, and microbes colonizing, colonizing the fetus at that point. Um, there's some debate about this, but overall, it looks like that's not a big part of the equation of microbial colonization. And um, so each time an infant is born, it's this new ecosystem. It's like an island rising up out of the ocean that has no species on it. And suddenly there's this like land rush for, you know, this open territory. And, and so the, you know, we know that infants go through this really complex process of microbiota ass assembly over the first days, weeks, months, years of life. And then, you know, you get into um, switching to solid food, two to three years of age, um, there are some changes in um, childhood, adolescence, working into adulthood, but that first, you know, um, zero to uh, one year is a super dynamic time with really um, kind of stereotypical developmental changes in the gut microbiota that appear to um, have the possibility of going wrong and um, causing problems for inf infants in some instances. But you know, if you step away from that extreme side of things going wrong, there all also are a lot of different trajectories that developmental process can take because our microbiota is so malleable and so plastic. And those trajectories can be affected by all sorts of factors in early life. So an example is whether an infant is born by C-section or born vaginally. We know from um, beautiful work that's been done in the field that uh, infants that are born by C-section actually have a um, gut microbiota that looks more like human skin than it does like either the vag the birth canal, the, the vagina microbiota, or um, the mother's um, stool microbiota. Babies that are born through the birth canal have initial colonization of vaginal microbes and of stool microbes from their mother. And so just these first days, whether you're born by C-section or through, or through natural childbirth, your gut microbiota looks very different. And then compound on top of that, whether you're breastfed or formula fed, whether your family has a pet or doesn't have a pet, whether you're exposed to antibiotics, um, there are all these factors that really can change that developmental process and really change your microbial identity eventually in life. The reason that this is... Um, that the field is playing, paying really close attention to this and studying this right now is because we know from animal studies that depending upon the microbes that you get early in life, you can send the immune system or metabolism of an organism or other parts of their biology in totally different developmental trajectories. So what microbes you're colonized or with early in life can really change your biology. And we can come back to that later. But yeah, we should. The, you know, the getting back to that original question of where do your microbes come from, 
you'd think because you're born through your mother's birth canal or exposed to her skin microbes that a lot of your microbes would come from your mother. But it actually turns out that, you know, we can certainly detect that signal. We certainly see maternal microbes in the infant, but there are a lot of microbes that are coming from other places, uh, surfaces, other people, perhaps other caregivers, but perhaps uh, strangers as well. So we acquire our microbes from a, a variety of sources. The first ones are, are from our mom or from our caregivers from the hospital, but then we add to that tremendously over the first year or so of life. Incredible. You even said um, pets. So uh, if a kid in there, uh, if there's a dog in the home or a parakeet in the home, that clearly they have a microbiome also, and potentially the child is deriving microbiota species from from those pets. It, it, exactly. Yeah. And so the you know I the um, best studies that have been done have just looked at pets in the household as a factor and whether that <clears throat> changes. Um, you know, the group of infants that have a pet to look slightly different than the group of infants that don't have a pet. And then the question is, what what is the pet doing to change those microbes? And some of it is probably actually contributing direct members of the microbiota. Actually, you know, we um, I have a dog. That dog um, occasionally will lick my mouth without me, like, paying attention, you know, and that's probably introducing microbes. Um, we also know that, um, you know, pets are are down in the dirt, they're, you know, outside, they're, you know, they're, they're being exposed to a lot of environmental microbes. And so just, um, you know, pets serving as a conduit for a bunch of microbes that we wouldn't otherwise come in contact with um, is, a, is a possibility as well. Okay, well, we will return to uh, pets and in particular your dog, an amazing dog, by the way. I met your dog just the other day. And I had to force myself, I had to pry myself away from it's a Havanese, right? Havanese. Incredible. What is your dog's name? Louis. Louis, Lu Louis Pasteur. Louis Pasteur. Yeah, yeah. How appropriate. <laughs> um, amazing dog. What a personality on yeah. that dog. Um, the, the issue that I, I think a lot of people are probably wondering is what, what is a healthy microbiome? And what is it? What is it supporting? We we hear that you need a healthy microbiome to support the immune system or metabolism or even the gut brain axis. How do we define a healthy versus a unhealthy microbiome? Some people might know the unhealthy microbiome as dysbiosis is the word that I encounter in the literature. But given that there's so many species of microbiota and given that I think we probably each have a signature pattern of microbiota, how do we define healthy versus unhealthy microbiota? Is there a test for this? Um, later we'll talk about technologies for testing microbiota. There are a lot of companies now, a lot of people sending stool samples in the mail. Um, never look at the postal service the same way again, but there it's out there and it's getting analyzed. So how should I think about this? I, I can think about things like heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, BMI, um, yeah. all sorts of metrics of health. How should I think about the microbiota? How do I know if my microbiome is healthy or unhealthy? Yeah, it's a, it's a million dollar question right now in the field. And there's a lot of different ways of thinking about that. And I can talk about some of those, but I would say that, you know, um, <clears throat> there are sessions at conferences, there are review articles being commissioned. There are all sorts of kind of thought pieces about this right now. Like what is a healthy microbiota? What are the features that define it? And, you know, I think before diving into this, the important thing to to realize is it's a complex topic. Um, context matters a lot. What's healthy for one person or one population may not be healthy for another person or population. And um, the microbiota is um, malleable. You know, it's plastic. It changes um, our human biology, which I think is, you know, how we think about health quite often, BMI and, you know, longevity, reproductive success, however you want to define it, um, it certainly um, can accommodate a variety of configurations of gut microbiota. And we don't have, um, a, you know, it's really hard to untangle um, all of the different factors of what, what could be, you know, very healthy versus a little bit less healthy. Um, so so I, I will say that there's no single answer to this, but there's some really important considerations. And um, perhaps the best way to start talking about this is to go back to um, the inception of the Human Microbiome Project, which was this um, program that, that NIH started. They invested a lot of money in 2008, 2009 for um, really uh, propelling 
the um, field of, of gut microbiome research. It was um, becoming evident at that point that this was not just a curiosity of human biology, that it was probably really important for our health. And they had all this wonderful sequencing technology from the human genome sequencing um, project. And with the human genome complete at that point, they started turning that technology to sequencing our gut microbes. And, you know, it's important to contextualize the amount of information that they're trying to um, document the, you know, collective genome of our gut microbes is on the order of um, 100 to 500 times larger than our human genome. So it's just in terms of the number of genes. So it's just this vast number of, of genes. And then if you start getting into some of the fine variation, it's, you know, scales by 10 to 100 fold. So really a huge amount of information they're trying to document. And, and, the, and so it's a, a, it was a wonderful investment and it continues to pay dividends to this day. Um, but one of their goals of that project was to try to define what a healthy microbiome is versus a diseased microbiome in different contexts. And so they started um, enrolling a bunch of healthy people and a bunch of people with, for instance, inflammatory bowel disease and other diseases. Um, and, and the idea was, let's, let's document those microbiomes, what microbes are there, what genes are there. And then we can start to get a sense of what are, what are the commonalities of the, the healthy people and and you know how how can that, that go wrong in these different disease states? And um, you know they they there were some answers from that, but it, you um, through those studies we really started to get the image that there is this tremendous individuality in the gut microbiome, and um, and so it's it's really hard to um, start drawing. Um, you know, conclusions after initial pass of that project of what is a healthy microbiome. But the other thing that we started to realize at the same time, there were studies going on documenting the gut microbiome of um, traditional populations of humans, hunter-gatherers, uh, rural agricultural populations. And um, those studies were really mind-blowing from the perspective of, you know, all these people are healthy, they're living very different lifestyles, and their microbiome doesn't look anything like a healthy American microbiome. So does that mean that the healthy American microbiome is healthy, but only in the context of living in the United States and consuming what's consumed here? Um, or is it that there is a superior microbiome signature somewhere in our history or currently in the world? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's that's kind of a, a, a big question right now. I think, you know... Um, there's a great quote from Dubchansky that says nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And, you know, the, these traditional populations are all modern people um, living on the planet now, but their lifestyle does represent, um, uh, you know, the, the closest approximation to how our ancestors, um, early humans lived. And, and so those microbiomes, and now we know from sequencing of paleofeces, the microbiome of these traditional populations is representative, more representative of the microbiome that we evolved with that, that um, potentially shaped our human genome. And so one possibility is that in the industrialized world, we have a, a different microbiome from traditional populations and that microbiome is well adapted to our current lifestyle and therefore healthy in the context of an industrialized society. And there probably are elements of that that are true. Um, but another possibility is that this is a microbiome that's gone off the rails, that it is, um, you know, deteriorating in the face of antibiotic use and um, uh, all the um, problems associated with a uh, um, industrialized diet, Western diet, um, and that even though the Human Microbiome um, Project documented the microbiome of healthy people, healthy Americans, that what they really may have been documenting there is a perturbed microbiota that's uh, really predisposing people to a variety of inflammatory and metabolic diseases. It reminds me of the, um, as a neurobiologist, I was weaned in the, in the landscape of so-called critical periods where early life environment uh, very strongly shapes the, the brain. And so many studies were done on animals raised in traditional cages with a water bottle and some food, maybe a few other animals of the same species. And then people came along and said, wait, normally these species in the wild would have things like things to climb over and things to go through. And you provide those very basic elements and all of a sudden the architecture of neural circuits looks very different and you realize that you were studying a deprived condition. Um, and earlier you actually referred to, if I understood correctly, to critical periods for gut microbiome development. Um, is it 
uh, fair to say that there are critical periods, meaning if my, let's say my, let's aim it at me. If my, if uh, my gut microbiome was um, dysbiotic, it was off um, early in life, can I rescue that through proper conditions and exercise? Or is there some sort of um, fixed pattern that's going to be hard for me to escape from. Yeah. The, the, there's a big field that's emerging now that, um, you know, we refer to as kind of reprogramming the gut microbiome. And, you know, I think if we want to conceptualize humans as this aggregate human microbial biology, um, you know, most people have heard of CRISPR and the ability to um, potentially change our human genome in ways that correct, um, genetic problems. Um, that's a wonderful technology um, and has kind of put on the table, you know, genetic engineering for curing disease, but it's much easier to change gut microbes for a problem just because that, that community is, is malleable. Um, the issue that I think um, we're seeing in the field is that uh, microbiomes quite often, whether they're diseased or healthy, exist in stable states. They kind of tend towards this um, well that has gravity to it in a, in a way, biological gravity, where um, it's really hard to dislodge that community from that state. So even individuals, for instance, that get antibiotics, um, you know, you uh, take oral antibiotics, the community takes this huge hit. We know that a bunch of microbes die, the composition changes, and, you know, that represents a period of vulnerability where pathogens can come in and take over and cause disease. But if that doesn't happen, the microbiota kind of works its way back to something that is not exactly like, but similar to the pre-antibiotic treatment. Uh, we know with dietary perturbations, um, quite often you'll see a really rapid change to the gut microbiome. And then this, it's almost like a memory where it snaps back to this, something that's very similar to the original state, even though the diet remains different. And so there's this incredible, what we refer to as resilience of the gut microbiome and, and um, resistance to change, or at least resistance to establishing a new stable state. So that doesn't mean it's hopeless to change an unhealthy microbiome to a, a healthy microbiome, but it does mean that we need to think carefully about, um, you know, restructuring these communities in ways where we can achieve a new stable state that will resist the microbial community getting pulled back to that original state. And it, you know, one of the really kind of simplest and nicest examples um, of this is a, a, an experiment that um, we performed uh, with, with mice where we, you know, we're feeding mice a normal mouse diet, um, a lot of nutrients there for the gut microbiota, things like dietary fiber. And um, we switched those mice, half the mice to a, a low fiber diet. And we were basically asking the question that, you know, if you switch to kind of a Western-like diet, a low-fiber, higher-fat diet, uh, what happens to the gut microbiota? And we saw the microbiota change. It lost diversity. It was very similar to what we see in, um, in the difference between industrialized and traditional populations. But when we brought back a healthy diet, a lot of the microbes returned. You know, it was fairly, you know, there, there was this kind of memory where it went back to very similar to its original state. The difference is that when we put the mice on the low fiber, high fat diet, and then kept them on that for multiple generations, um, we saw this progressive deterioration over the course of generations, where by the fourth generation, the gut microbiome was a, you know, a fraction of what it originally was. Let's say 30% of the species only remained, um, something like 70% of the species had gone extinct or appeared to have gone extinct. We then put those mice back onto a high fiber diet and we didn't see recovery. Mm. So in that case, it's a, um, a situation where a new stable state has been achieved. Um, in that case, it's probably because those mice don't actually have access to the microbes that they've lost. And we actually know that we did a, the control experiment of um, mice on a high fiber diet for four generations. They maintain all their microbes. If we take those fourth generation mice with all the diversity and do a fecal transplant into the mice that had lost their microbes, but had been returned to a high fiber diet, all of the diversity was reconstituted. So it was, um, you know, so your, your question of like, how do we establish new stable states? How do we get back to a healthy microbiota? If we have taken a lot of antibiotics or have a deteriorated microbiota, it's probably a combination of having access to the right microbes 
And we can talk about what that access looks like. It may look like therapeutics in the future. There are a lot of companies working on creating cocktails of healthy microbes, but it'll be a combination of access to the right microbes and um, nourishing those microbes with the, the proper diet. Very interesting. This multi-generational study reminds me of something that I was told early in my training, which was that uh, it takes a long time for a trait to evolve, but not a long time for traits to devolve. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> which generally um, is, is true of uh, human behavior too, although um, it, de it depends. <laughs> we can all do better nonetheless. Very interesting. So I have a, um, a, a, a puzzle or a, a bit of a conundrum um, around this notion of, of species of microbiota. So if the if the pH, if the acidity is differs along uh, the digestive tract, but is more or less fixed for a given location, right? I mean, unless something is really off, the pH of the stomach is within a particular range, and the right. the the intestine and so forth. And certain microbiota thrive in at a given station, a given location along the, the digestive tract, and the pH is sort of fixed, um, more or less. I'm trying to figure out what 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 is allowing certain microbiota to s stay in a given location? Why don't they migrate up or down? So are they pH sensitive? And that's what, what they're selecting for along the, the tract. And um, I'm also trying to figure out how these changes in food so robustly change the microbiome. It's, it, the way you describe it, it almost makes it sound like food is the, the variable that's going to dictate the quality of the microbiome. Although I'm sure there are other factors as well. And then in the back of my mind, I, I don't know that I want to ask this question, but I really want to ask this question, which is where are they in there exactly? And why don't they all get flushed out, right? right. Um, if 30% uh, of, of fecal matter is um, microbiota, um, then it, where are they living? Are they, in, are they along the, the lining and the little microvilli of the intestine? And what are they attaching to and, and interacting with? Uh, we know there are neurons in there. Um, we know, especially within the stomach, there's a lot of work now being done on the, the gut neurons and how they signal to the brain and so forth. But who are they talking to in terms of the, the host cells? Yeah. And um, because if it's just from food, I imagine that they're in there having their good time or, uh, or not, and then some are getting flushed out or not. But how do they actually stay in there? Yeah. Who are they attaching to? What are they talking about? What yeah. are they doing for fun? Yeah. And so forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. super, super interesting. So- um, I'll come back to the attachment question and kind of like why they don't get washed out because this is a super fascinating question. And, um, you know, I think your your um, initial point of like the the kind of regional differences in what's happening in terms of physiology, biochemistry along the length of the gut is really interesting. There certainly is a pH gradient along the length of the gut. There is um, actually bicarbonate that's secreted into the small intestine to try to neutralize stomach acid. There also is bile that's secreted um, that creates a, a different chemical environment and there are bile-loving bacteria that kind of live in that region of the gut. Um, and then, you know, there there is an, a nutrient gradient just because as food leaves the stomach, it, um, you know, a lot of the simple nutrients are absorbed. And so you might see microbes in the small intestine, for instance, that are better at consuming simple sugars, but you won't find many microbes in the colon like that because all the simple sugars have been depleted at that point. Um, and then the immune system is a big factor as well. And the immune system is incredibly active in the small intestine. Um, the small intestine is this really interesting challenge for the host because it's a tissue that's been, you know, its purpose is mainly absorptive. And so there has to be flow of... Um, a lot of things, you know, a lot of nutrients from the luminal contents into host cells. And so that means the barrier can't be as fortified. And so the, the immune system is incredibly active in the small intestine to make sure that microbes aren't getting so close. And if they are getting close, there's a response to them to put them back in their right location. Um, so there's, you know, a, and then you know, along this whole kind of architecture of the gut, there's the longitudinal gradients, um, things like like pH and so forth. And, and I should say that, you know, pH starts to drop again in the colon because a lot of those microbes are fermenting things and producing acids. And so you actually end up with, uh, you know, the, the pH starting to drop, not as low as the stomach, but starting to drop again if there's a lot of fermentation happening in the colon. In addition, you also have a gradient from the host surface epithelium out to the, the middle of the gut. 
And that is likely the, the key for what is retained in the gut and how the community isn't washed out. So lining the gut, we have epithelial cells in the small intestine. They're largely absorptive. Um, in the colon, there's a lot of mucus production and we also see this in the small intestine and this mucus lining is this, um, you know, substance that we secrete largely made of carbohydrate actually. And the purpose of that is to keep microbes in the right spot and to allow nutrients and water to be absorbed in the small intestine and large intestine. And so it's this mesh work that is supposed to keep out large things like bacteria and let in small things like, like nutrients. Um, that mucus layer is, um, it turns over more slowly than the luminal contents passing by. And so um, if a microbe learns to hold on to that mucus layer, it can actually resist the flow of the, the contents of the I gut. See. And so there, there's a, a many microbes in the gut that are not just good at attaching to mucus, but also good at nibbling on it, at eating it. And, you know, there are these bacteria like Acromanzia mucinifla, mucus loving. It's um, one of its main things it does is actually eat mucus in the gut. That's its lifestyle. And, and so there, there's, you know, an incredible um, gradient of, of activity from the host tissue working your way out to the middle of the gut. What's amazing is some microbes actually do penetrate past the mucus and there are these invaginations in the intestine known as crypts, actually where the stem cells live that produce the epithelium. And there are microbial communities that can form in those crypts. And we don't know completely what their function is, but we've done some studies that appear to indicate that if you can localize to a crypt, you've hit the jackpot as a microbe for being able to maintain dominance in the gut. So if you sit in the crypt and something similar to you, another microbe that's similar to you comes into the gut, you can actually exclude that microbe. And the thinking is that it can't find a spot to resist being washed out of the gut. So there probably are these little niches close to host tissue in the mucus that are absolutely essential for, um, for resisting getting washed out with the, with the flow of all the contents. Incredible. That raises a question about two things that are uh, reasonably popular. Uh, one is this notion of cleanses um, from either direction. People will consume things by mouth to try and cleanse their digestive tract. This is, there's a long history of this. Um, yeah. I'm not recommending this. There's differing opinions on whether or not this is good or bad. And the other is um, fasting or time-restricted feeding. Uh, the reason uh, I ask about time-restricted feeding is my understanding is that after a prolonged period of fasting, there's some um, autoabsorption or um, digestion of one's own uh, digestive tract that then gets renewed. In other words, you, your intestine and stomach start eating its own lining to some extent in the absence of food. So what do we know about cleanses? Oh, and then I suppose there's cleanses from the other direction too, right? Which are uh, less popular, but um, I, I've never run the statistics, but I um, but I certainly exist out there. Uh, what are what's the idea about cleanses and fasting as it relates to the health or the dysbiosis of the microbiota? Yeah, you know, there hasn't been a lot of high quality science in this area. And so it's really hard to conclude whether these are good or good for health or bad for health. The, you know, I think the the fasting, you know, we're we're in a really interesting situation in the industrialized world because we have so many problems associated with our digestive tract. And that probably has to do with our um, highly processed diet and perhaps having a microbiota that's fairly perturbed as well. And so, you know, um, whether doing things like this are good or bad, um, it, it's really hard to define because we may be starting off in a fairly bad state anyway. There's so many diseases that we're dealing with, metabolic syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, that just put a massive portion of the population in a very different category than people that are thinking about how do I maintain health? How do I live a long life um, from starting off in what we consider a fairly healthy state? And so things like, you know, fasting um, and, and a lot of other therapies that have been developed in the field, um, you know, I think ketogenic diet may be kind of in this category as well. 
there can be tremendous benefits in terms of um, their impact in the context of metabolic syndrome and for people that are battling, um, you know, eating a continual bad diet or something like that. So it, and it, adherence. I think one of the pop, one of the reasons for the popularity of intermittent fasting, um, time restricted feeding, uh, and sort of uh, ex- what do they call them now? Um, exclusion diets where you entirely exclude meat or you entirely exclude plants or whatever it right. is, is the, that adherence is sometimes easier in the all or none. Um, in, as neurobiologists, we think of this as a go, no go circuitry. Uh, it's harder to make, uh, uh, decisions, uh, nuanced decisions often about food than it is to just eliminate entire categories of food. Not eating for many people yeah. is easier than eating smaller portions. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, so I, some of it I think is neurobiological and psychological. Absolutely. Um, and we've had, you know, gastroenterology fellows in our lab that come in and we kind of, you know, I think that to kind of slice through the nuance of all this, there's a very simple recipe and a really well accepted um, kind of broad definition of what a healthy diet is, you know, kind of the the Mediterranean diet, plant-based diet um, is, you know, there's just a ton of data that um, particularly people of European ancestry, but there's a, you know, a pretty broad acceptance that if you eat mostly plants for most people, that's going to be very healthy to the point where, um, you know, a, a, a wonderful colleague of ours, Christopher Gardner, who's studied diet um, his whole life, um, trying to establish what a healthy diet is. And people was giving advice. I saw him giving advice to a um, dietitian who was trying to get all the rules of like what what she should be recommending to um, people that she deals with that are interested in a healthy diet. And she said, so the number one, I'm going to say plant-based fiber is probably super important and that should be, you know, very high on the list. And she goes on to number two and he said, stop. He said, if people do number one well, you don't need to know any other rules. Hmm. I mean, it's basically like if you can have a high fiber plant-based diet, um, for most people, at least, you know, talking about the bucket of people that are already in a healthy state, you don't really need to think about other things because you can't eat too much meat. You can't eat too many sweets. You've already eaten a huge amount of plant-based fiber. Your gut is full. You're not going to be hungry. Um, and and it kind of takes care of worrying about what should I eat or what what shouldn't I eat. Just eat a ton of whole plant, you know, whole grains, legumes, um, vegetables, uh, fruit that's high, that's high fiber based, not high Does sugar. Does it completely exclude meat and fish and dairy? He, and he was saying like, you know, people can add their own spins on this, but I, I think that the the main rule is just start off with, you know, and it kind of gets back to, to Michael Pollan's mantra, you know, um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Uh, you know, I think if you stick with kind of these simple rules and don't overthink, like, should I have this? You know, can I eat eggs? Can I eat, you know, just kind of stick to these simple rules. It makes it very approachable. But I agree, like, so these gastroenterology fellows that we've had in our lab say that they, it's really hard. We, we kind of say to them, why won't you give this dietary advice? It's really well known. And they just said, well, it's, it's really hard to get people to change their diet unless you're doing either a, a go, no go sort of thing, like, uh, or eliminating something. So, you know, if ca- carrots are giving you problems, don't eat carrots. And that's a very simple, easy instruction to follow, but, um, doesn't really deal with the root problem of why can't you eat carrots because you should be able to eat carrots. Most people can eat carrots. And, um, and so I, so I think that, you know, there, we, um, yeah, we, we, when we're, when we're thinking about, things like um, fasting and, you know, all these different dietary regimes and cleanses that people do, um, we, we have to step back for a moment and say, okay, well, what, what are really the, the big high level rules that we should take home? And then if you are experiencing problems and you want to think about how to deal with them, it's good to go to an evidence-based method where there's actually data to back it up. The, you know, the, the data in the field really shows that with like fasting, uh, particularly if you go to like animals that hibernate or things like that, where there's really extended fast, you actually have um, a microbiota come up that's, uh, that blooms in the absence of, of food coming in through diet. <clears throat> that's really good at, at eating mucus. So you have um, you know, bacteria that's, that specialize in eating nutrients derived from the host because there's no other nutrients to live on. Now, whether this is good or bad, we don't know, but it it seems like um, the, you know, consumption of mucus in excess 
is a problem from the standpoint of microbes getting too close to host tissue and inciting inflammation, which is what we see in animal models when we deprive of dietary fiber. We see these mucus utilizers become abundant and inflammatory markers start to come on. So, so fasting short-term might be fine. Probably, um, you know, there's definitely benefits that are seen metabolically um, in terms of what it means for long-term health from the standpoint of the gut microbiota. I would say we don't have the answer to that yet. In terms of the, you know, the cleanses and the flushes and all this, uh, personally, I, I think it's a terrible idea. I mean, we know that like if, um, you know, in studies that are being done now to reprogram the gut microbiota to install a completely new microbial community, the first step is to wash away the resident microbial community that's there. So if you're in the process of acquiring a really good microbiota and you know how to do that, then the, the flushing everything out is great. Um, otherwise, what is happening is you're kind of leaving rebuilding of the community to chance. Like, what is it? And so, um, you know, what, what microbes are going to colonize, who's going to take up space after you do this flush or cleanse. And, um, you know, that I think it's a, a little bit like playing Russian roulette. You may end up with a, a good microbial community in there afterwards. You may not. Um, you certainly want to pay close attention to what you're eating while you're doing the reconstitution of the community after you do something like that. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. I know a lot of people are interested in these kinds of elimination diets and intermittent fasting um, slash time restricted feeding seems to be getting some traction in part because at some level we are all doing this when we sleep. We're, most of us aren't eating while we sleep anyway. And um, adjusting the numbers seems um, more accessible for a lot of people. We have a lot of colleagues at Stanford who I, I know happen to follow that regimen um, or a time restricted feeding regimen, but um, also some who follow the more traditional meal spacing as well, of course. the uh, One of the things that I wonder about as we talk about um, primarily plant-based with some, you know, what did you say the pollen thing was? It was uh, eat uh, mostly plants um, and then maybe some meat, but not too much or, yeah, not, or not too eat, much. Eat food, mostly plants, not too much. Got it. Or sorry, um, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. Got yeah. it. Um, you know, and uh, in uh, just, I, have, I hear this again and again. I know um, there are a number of people who do seem to do well on a lower carbohydrate um you know, and even some people who report feeling much better on a like really strictly almost meat organ only diet. And the only reason I raise this is not, uh, I don't participate in other, I'm, in a, I'm one of those uh, omnivores uh, that out there. Um, I do eat some meat um, and I do eat plants as well. But the reason I raise this is that earlier you were talking about um, communities that may have microbiota that are um, healthier than ours or at least different than ours. And there are communities in the world that uh, that subsist largely on animal products, or for which unprocessed animal products are considered the richest nutrient foods in those communities. Protein is very scarce, and uh, ancestrally, protein was was more scarce. So eggs and meat and things of that sort. So could there be a genetic component? In other words, if we fast forward 10 years and we actually can make sense of all this human genome stuff, are we going to find that someone who has um, Scandinavian uh, roots or somebody who has South American roots or somebody who descended from a different tribe will do better on one particular diet versus another and thereby, or I should say, and in parallel with that, that their gut microbiome will have different signatures that are, so your microbiome might thrive on plants and mine might thrive on organ meats. And as I say this, um, I'm not a big consumer of organ meats. I'm just laying this out for sake of example. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, great. Um, so, um, a few notes. Uh, the first one has to do with the carbohydrates and restriction of carbohydrates and some people feeling healthier when they, mm -hmm. they cut carbohydrates out. My guess is, <clears throat> this is, this is my theory, um, to be tested, um, that people feel better cutting carbohydrates out because the diet that we eat in the United States and in industrialized countries, the carbohydrates are largely crap. Processed. They, they're processed. Right. They're, it's like starch, simple sugar. Um, it's things that contribute to glycemic index. It's it's these sugars that that we eat. They make it to our small intestine. They get chopped up into simple sugars, absorbed into our bloodstream, and we have a ton of glucose then coursing through our veins, which we know is bad and can lead to things like diabetes. Um, if the carbo <clears throat> the carbohydrates that were in our diet were complex carbohydrates 
dietary fiber. And we like to refer to the subset of dietary fiber that the microbiota can actually access as microbiota accessible carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. And the reason that we like that term is it has the word carbohydrate in it. And it's um, to point out that not all carbs are bad. It's just there are bad carbs or carbs that are bad if you consume them in too high a quantity, things like, you know, uh, table sugar and simple starches. But there are good carbs as well. And these microbiota accessible carbohydrates are the complex ones that we can't digest and fuel um, our gut microbiota. Our gut microbiota can ferment them. And um, so the, you know, I think, I think um, we probably all would be better off with less of the carbs that were typically served, but most of us and probably the vast majority of us would be better off by consuming a lot more carbs that were complex, that were microbiota accessible. Um, and I'll come back to why that's important in terms of our biology. There are some mechanisms that are known as to why those complex carbohydrates are so important for our health for most of us. Um, I think this aspect of human genetic adaptation to diet is super interesting. And then layer on top of that, gut microbiota <clears throat> adaptation to diet, which is another layer of this that um, is also fascinating. It's very clear that over very short periods of time, humans can adapt to differences in their diet. Lactase persistence is kind of the classic example of this. Just over the past 10,000 years, um, humans, you know, certain groups of humans have adapted to being able to consume dairy um, by taking this enzyme, lactase, that normally is just expressed in most of the world's population early in life to be, <clears throat> be able to metabolize lactose in breast milk. Um, by extending the expression of that throughout life, now you can consume milk for your whole life. And so that is an example of specific populations of humans, um, human genome genetically adapting to diet in a very short period of time. And this, there are other examples of this, and undoubtedly this has happened um, throughout the world to various aspects of diet. So certainly um, it's important to remember that there will be um, different diets that are better for different groups based on what genes you you harbor and, and have in your in your human genome. The other aspect on top of that is that um, you know there there are um, good examples of the gut microbiome adapting to cultural differences in diet. And the classic example of this is the degradation of seaweed. So we know that um, most Americans, if you eat sushi and, and there's nori there and you, you eat um, some of this, this seaweed, it has a dietary fiber in it known as porphyrin. That porphyrin will shoot through most of us untransformed, inert substance. It, you know, it'll do other things like retain water and serve as kind of something like cellulose, not be um, fermented at a high level. Um, if somebody from Southeast Asia that's always consumed um, seaweed and is part of a culture that consumes seaweed, eats seaweed, they have a gut microbe that can now metabolize porphyrin. And so there are these very specific gene transfer events where the genes for breaking down porphyrin have been imported into the microbiome of many people in Southeast Asia to, um, you know, we can think of it as helping digest porphyrin, but it's really just a microbe that's found a niche, found a way to make a living in the gut by consuming something that's common in the diet there. So there are these different layers. There are human genetic adaptations and there are microbiome adaptations that are cultural and, and based on people's geographic location. Um, but, you know, the, there's no escaping the fact that for much of human evolution, the vast majority of people that are on this planet had ancestors that were hunter-gatherers, foraging, consuming huge quantities of plant material, just because that's, that's what was there. And so one of the groups that we study, the Hadza hunter-gatherers in Africa, um, and I, I should um, take a moment just to say that, you know, um, our research and, and research of many people in our field and other fields rely on study of indigenous communities. And it's really important to, um, think of these communities as, um, you know, our equals. They're modern people on the planet. They have interesting lifestyles that are informative with regard to certain aspects of, of human biology. Um, but in many cases, they also are, um, 
you know, leading a vulnerable existence. And so we really take great care in our research program. And it's important for people to realize that, um, you know, these populations take part in our research because they're wonderful research partners. And we need to be mindful of kind of thinking about how, um, yeah, we, both we talk about them and, and use our data that that has um, been gained through their um, generous contribution to our research program. The Hadza hunter-gatherers, it's estimated, consume on the order of 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber per day. And that's in stark contrast to the typical American that consumes about 15 grams. So somewhere ten, seven to tenfold decrease in the main nutrient that feeds our gut microbiome in the American diet. The, the Hadza are, um, you know, one example. There are diff many different foraging populations, but the vast majority of these populations consume huge amounts of dietary fiber because plants are the reliable, consistent source. You know, if you, as a um, hunter-gatherer, go on a hunt, usually that hunt is unsuccessful. You know, I think the data are that, you know, one out of 20 to 30 hunts are successful in landing actually big game for the Hadza. They have, you know, birds that they shoot and small animals, but quite often um, day after day, they're relying upon uh, berries, tubers, baobab fruit, you know, they're, they're relying on the plants in their environment. And actually, if you, um, you go to the data and look at what their food, food preferences are, their food preferences are actually meat and honey. So they don't eat a high fiber diet because they love fiber. They eat a high fiber diet because that's what's available and consistent um, for them to, to survive. But you know, our brains are wired for caloric density. And so if you took a, a Hadza and put them in a restaurant in the United States, they would make the same crappy decisions that we make because we, you know, all want sugar and fat and calories. It's how our, our brain is wired. And protein and fat are essential for brain development as far as we know, right? So the, so it sounds like the, the Hadza, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Oh, do, you said would prefer to eat meat and honey, but they do... Con they happen to consume a lot of plant fiber as a consequence of what's available. The, um, one of the questions I, I have as it relates um, to all of this is it, it sounds to me like there is no question from the pure vegan all the way to the extreme opposite, which would be pure meat diet, um, that avoiding processed foods is a good idea yeah. or heavily processed foods in general. And I mean, not that, uh, you know, the occasional consumption is, is, um, necessarily bad, but I'm, whether or not one is thinking about one macronutrient profile or another, it sounds like consuming pro processed foods is just bad for the microbiome. Can we say that categorically? For sure. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Whether you know, so you're low carb person, you're zero carb person, you're extreme vegan, no meat. Whether or not you're all meat, organ meat, it sounds to me as if uh, the number one thing, maybe even dare I say, above Chris's uh, uh, point about plants. Although I'm not going to challenge Chris Gardner on <laughs> on, on nutrition, <laughs> I would be uh, way outside the lane lines to do that. But is that to avoiding processed foods? Yeah, is paramount. Yeah, and I think that's completely. Cr compatible with what Christopher was saying. He was saying, if you put prioritize getting a huge amount of, of whole plant-based food with a lot of fiber first, you're not going to have room for eating a lot of processed food. Yeah. So, yeah. so it's kind of the same as avoiding processed food. Right. So I think that those are exactly the same rule. And I think that you're exactly right. And we can break down, you know, there's a lot of data of why different components of processed food are so bad for us and so bad for our microbiome. And I can talk about a few examples of that. But the flip side of this is this mechanism of, you know, and, and again, thinking about the spectrum of a plant-based diet versus a meat-based diet, um, you know, there's a, a lot of data to tell us that a meat or, or ketogenic or high-fat diet may have big benefits in terms of short-term metabolic health. That's typically how people think about that diet. Um, there's also a lot of heart disease that's linked with that as well. There's good literature for that, which is something to for people to to look at and be aware of. The plant-based diet, if you're eating a bunch of complex, um, you know, fibers that feed your gut microbiota, your gut microbiota produces these substances called short-chain fatty acids, things like butyrate. And it's known that these short-chain fatty acids play really essential components, both in terms of fueling colonocytes, enforcing the barrier, keeping inflammation low, regulating the immune system, regulating metabolism. And so, you know, 
a lot of people think of dietary fiber as this inert substance that passes through, makes us feel full maybe for a little bit, but we get hungry afterwards right away. If you're eating a lot of fiber that's feeding your gut microbiota, your gut microbiota is just producing this vast array of fermentation end products that then get absorbed into our bloodstream and have all of these tremendous cascading effects that appear to be largely beneficial on our biology. And so to think about that paradigm of simple carbs versus complex carbs, in the case of simple carbs, you end up with high blood sugar, you know, something that will spike your insulin and, you know, have all kinds of weird metabolic effects. In the case of complex carbohydrates, you'll end up with very low blood sugar because most of those have low glycemic index and a bunch of short chain fatty acids that are having regulatory roles. So, so just to, to round out that, that topic, I think there is a reason to think that, you know, maybe not appropriate for absolutely everyone out there, but I think the vast majority of people, particularly given the statistics of what we know people eat in the United States and in industrialized countries, most people would reap tremendous health benefits from eating more whole plant-based dietary fiber. Now, processed foods, I think, is this other dimension where you have all of these weird chemicals, artificial sweeteners, weird fats, um, you know, a lot of refined, simple nutrients, the simple nutrients we've talked about. But we know that, for instance, artificial sweeteners can have a massive negative impact on the gut microbiome and can lead us towards metabolic syndrome, actually. There's been beautiful work out of the Weizmann Institute on this. And then emulsifiers, these compounds that are put in processed foods to help them maintain shelf stability so things don't separate. And so, um, you know, all the, the moisture content is retained appropriately. Um, many of these are known to disrupt the mucus layer. And as soon as you start disrupting that barrier, that can lead you in the direction of inflammation. And in animal models, we know that can lead towards metabolic syndrome as well. So there's, there's components of processed food that are, when studied in isolation, known to have a direct negative impact on gut biology and the microbiota. Yeah, the mention of artificial sweeteners is is interesting. I I confess uh, it's a third rail on social talking about artificial sweeteners. There are two camps it seems, or at least um, two camps. One that say artificial sweeteners are not detrimental at all. Another that says they're very detrimental, mainly based on the mouse studies. And then there are people in the middle that are. I put myself in that category. I drink the occasional diet soda. I don't consume them in large volume, but I'm sort of in the the middle there. However. The, um, and so I just throw that out there because I know immediately people um, are jumping on that. But I will just mention there's some recent data from out of um, Diego Borges' lab at Duke University that the neurons that live in the gut mucosa, these neuropod cells, can actually distinguish between artificial and um, true sweet sugar versus artificial uh, sweeteners. Um, based, they send different patterns of neural signals up to the brain and the brain circuitry seems strongly impacted. So I think that as the data emerge, we're hearing more and more of these artificial sweeteners um, either are problematic or at least are signaling different events in the, in the gut. Uh, I do want to make sure that we distinguish uh, artificial sweeteners from non-caloric plant-based sweeteners. Yeah. Um, and this is based on a mistake that I've made over and over again on the podcast, where I'll just kind of lump artificial sweeteners um, into one big category and say, and then I'll mention stevia. So what about plant-based sweeteners that yeah. are not artificial? They weren't manufactured in a laboratory like saccharin or sucralose or aspartame. Right. What Do we know anything about plant-based non-caloric sweeteners or low caloric sweeteners? Very little. You know, a lot of those have um, a lot more bang for the buck. They're they're incredibly sweet, so it takes a really small amount for them to trigger a huge amount of sweetness. And um, and so it's depending upon the mechanism of action by which these um, sweeteners that are not sugar are impacting our biology, it may be that those are actually, um, you know, less negative or, or more healthy than um, the ones that are artificial just because it requires less of them in the food for us to perceive that sweet taste. It may also be that because they're, you know, I don't think that everything is that's natural is better necessarily than things that are artificial, um, but it may be that because of, um, you know, kind of evolutionary exposure to these compounds in our diet, um, historically there are, I think, traditional populations that use these, for instance, to sweeten, um, you know, uh, sweeten different foods. Um, that our bodies just kind of know how to deal with those compounds better than the ones that are synthetic. Um, but I think the, you know, we, the studies still need to be done. Do you actively avoid artificial sweeteners, sucralose, aspartame, saccharin? You personally? Yeah, you know, so it, I, I do. I, I avoid them, but I'm not, I, you know, um, 
so the, you, um, I work closely with my wife, Erica, as you know, we do, uh, we run the lab together and we, um, you know, wrote this book, The Good Gut, where we kind of document our journey in changing our lifestyle, dietary habits, choices we make based on the research as we've gotten to know it in the gut microbiota over the past 15 years. And, um, you know, I, I think that one of the lessons that we've learned is that just uh, doing things in moderation makes it a lot um, easier and doing things slowly makes it a lot easier. And so, so there are very few rules that I have that are hard and fast. I'm, I'm a pretty flexible eater. I don't believe that having an artificial, you know, having a diet Coke, um, will, you know, somehow cascade into some terrible disease or something like that. Um, I, I try to avoid them. I don't really like the flavor of them. I'm, I'm super sensitive to the, the nuances of the flavor, even with the, you know, stevia and magracides from monk fruit and stuff like that. I just really, the off flavors are really hard for me to deal with. But, um, so, so, but I also in this journey of changing our diet, like when we started off in microbiome research, I was in the habit of, you know, in the afternoons having a sweet, a muffin or a cookie or something like that. And when we started to realize that, you know, we should be eating less sweets and eating more dietary fiber, this was an incredibly difficult change for me to make. I was just wired to kind of crave, you know, this classic scientist. Yeah. Scientists love the the pastry I, in the afternoon totally, and the coffee. Yeah, yeah. And in the old days, it used to be a cigarette too. Right, you know, right, exactly. When I started my training, a lot of people still smoked. Yeah, right. And it was only during my postdoctoral training that they eliminated smoking on campuses, and and productivity took a took a trough for a while, it, and until these people developed other tools to uh, to focus their attention. It, and, exactly, you know. exactly. So there there is this kind of like need, and then once you have an ingrained behavior and maybe things that are addictive, it becomes incredibly um, difficult to break that habit, and um, and so. I would say, you know, gradually over the course of like, you know, five or more years, we have, um, you know, migrated our diet away from sweet foods to um, things that are, are less sweet. Um, and it's, you know, it's been a journey. It's been a slow process. Um, but we've gotten to the point now where we've just retrained our palates. And it's amazing how this happens now where I'll have something that, you know, is something that I would have used to have like daily. And it's, it, unpalatable. I like, I just can't deal with the sweetness of it. And, and so I avoid, I certainly avoid artificial sweeteners, but I also avoid just sweet things in general that have sugar in them. Um, just because they, now they, you know, as originally I was make I was trying to be disciplined and trying to change my diet, but now they just don't taste good to me. Yeah. Likewise, I completely lost my appetite for sugar at the turn of the last year. And I don't know how to explain it, but I, the way I, um, even though I don't have an, a mechanistic explanation, I just, I say, I like sweet people. I don't like sweet food anymore. I just don't. I have not lost my appetite for um, fatty foods. I love ch cheese and uh, certain certain meats for me. I, I blame my Argentine lineage. I, is, uh, is, I gravitate towards them. But in any case, um, avoiding processed foods, probably avoiding sugars, emulsifiers, these kinds of things. And for people listening or watching, we're not setting up strict guidelines. We're just... Um, bouncing around the, uh, the carnival that is the microbiome and, and, and nutrition, because I think that these, we hear this uh, everywhere, eat this, don't eat that, or this is best for microbiome or worse for microbiome, but I, I'm hearing fiber again and again. So we're going to come back to fiber, but I want to make sure that we um, close the hatch on this issue of fasting and cleansing. Based on your answer earlier, it sounds to me like it is not necessary to do a cleanse or fast prior to an attempt to repopulate the microbiome. In other words, if I want to make my mi microbiome healthier, it sounds like I don't have to try and flush all the, the, yeah. the current microbiota out of there first. Is that correct? Yeah. You, you, you know, it's a very good question. And I don't mean to suggest that those things are <clears throat> known to be terrible, or I would just say like this, you know, the studies haven't been done. And to me, wiping out this microbial community, um, unless it's done with like some sort of, unless it's done in an informed way and we don't really have the information for how that would be done. It just seems like, um, you know, playing the lottery a little bit. Okay. And so, so I, I think, you know, I don't want to say that those are, it may be that when the study is done, those are shown to be amazing, but I just don't think we have the data to know that yet. So it's somewhat of an arbitrary thing. Um, if somebody, you know, out there feels way better when they do this and are not experiencing problems with it, then maybe it's the right thing for them. But I certainly can't, can't say that it's something great to do. I, I, I can't imagine a future 
where um, as the microbiome gets incorporated into this, you know, emerging paradigm of precision health, you go into a clinic, somebody types your microbiome and says, oh, there's a this huge, massive misconfiguration. You have all these um, engrafted bacteria that live that are residents in your gut microbiome that are sending out molecules that are not good for your health. It would be good if we do a mass reprogramming of it. The way that we do that is we flush your gut and we actually give a light antibiotic treatment to try to kill everything that's there. And then we repopulate with this other consortium of microbes that we've studied and know are healthy, know are compatible with your human genome and can be reinforced with a diet that we know is good for you. We'll install those microbes. We'll help you along in the diet to know so you know how to nourish those microbes. And that will be the way that we'll reconfigure your gut microbiome. So, you know, I, I can't imagine a future where that sort of flushing or cleansing is part of something for repopulating the gut. But right now it seems a little half-baked to me. Yeah. Great. I'd love to talk about fiber and fermented foods because you and Chris had a really, what I think is a really interesting and exciting paper at the end of last year about comparing um, the inflammatome, um, so inflammatory markers of people who ate a certain amount of fiber or a certain amount of uh, these fermented foods. It, this study is amazing for several reasons, but um, almost as amazing is how diverse the interpretation of this study was in the media. If ever there was a study that was um, kind of hijacked by different priority schemes out there, yeah. um, it's this study. So you performed the study uh, with Chris and your postdocs and graduate students and staff. What are the major conclusions and what sorts of directives, if any, emerge from this study? And I'll just preface this again by saying, that if I wasn't clear, some news report said, ah, this means fiber is not important. Yeah. And then others said, this means fermented foods and fiber are important. And others said, fermented foods are the thing and the only thing. It, it was all over the place. Yeah. And um, th one of the reasons for doing this podcast at all is so that we can go straight to yeah. uh, the people who perform the work. Fantastic. And even though I'm not certainly not an expert in microbiome, give you the opportunity to share with me and me to ask the kinds of questions that have, I have zero agenda. I do like sauerkraut. I do drink the occasional uh, uh, kombucha. Um, I do like low sugar, not so sweet forms of fermented foods. So I would be delighted if fermented foods are good for me, but I have no stake in the fermented food industry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 great. Um, yeah, wonderful. And, and an important note there is is the one you pointed out that this is an incredible collaboration with Christopher Gardner's lab and, um, you know, a bunch of people, um, Erica Sonnenberg helped lead the study and then and then tons of, like you were saying, postdoc staff and um, other people at, at Stanford and then wonderful participants that um, were, were part of this study. So a, a huge team effort. Um, l let me take, before I dive into that study, let me take a step back because I think the reason that we did this study and, and kind of um, Christopher's group and, and our group has, has started to um, pursue this line of, of looking at dietary interventions and how they impact our microbiome, how they impact um, human biology goes back to this um, kind of epiphany that we we had while studying the gut microbiome. Because I think when we started studying it at Stanford, we were thinking about it as this kind of newly appreciated aspect of our biology, almost like um, finding an organ that we didn't know was there and starting to think about like all the drug targets that were there. Can we go in with small molecule drugs and think of ways to manipulate this community to ameliorate disease? And um, this is largely the mindset of Western medicine and largely born out of the era of infectious disease. Um, you wait for an infection to start a bacterial infection, you treat with antibiotics, and you know that's the way medicine is practiced. And that's become less successful over time as we've moved into this era of inflammatory Western diseases. And um, you know, with the exception of the, the current pandemic that's you know sweeping the world. Um, you know, largely moved out of the era of infectious diseases, at least infectious bacterial diseases, that this paradigm of waiting for diseases to appear and come into the clinic um, is not really very effective in the context of inflammatory Western diseases, autoimmune diseases, metabolic syndrome, uh, heart diseases and inflammatory disease, you know, the list goes on and on. And, um, and so, we started to think a lot about like, how can we get out in front of this? How can we think about like preventative ways 
of dealing with this crisis of metabolic and inflammatory diseases. And this tremendous, beautiful body of literature started to come forward in the field uh, about 10 years ago that showed that the gut microbiome is absolutely critical to modulating our immune status. So if you change the microbiome, you can fundamentally change how the immune system operates. And we know that the immune system is the, at the basis of a lot of these diseases, inflammatory chronic diseases. And so it, it brought up this possibility that maybe the fact that we're not nourishing this community well enough, maybe the fact that it's um, deteriorated over time um, due to all of the things that go along with an industrialized lifestyle, antibiotics and so forth. Um, maybe we have a microbiome right now in the industrialized world that is setting our immune system at a set point, simmering inflammation that's driving us towards these inflammatory diseases. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could figure out how to um, uh, use diet specifically, but just kind of learn the rules of how to reconfigure both the composition and function of our gut microbiome so that inflammation was different in our bodies so that each one of us was less likely to go on and to develop an inflammatory disease leading to better you know, longevity and health um, over the course of our life. And um, so we, we were you know, studying this in, actually in mouse models and realizing that um, you know, we really needed to start doing human studies. We needed to um, start studying microbiome in humans. And because we were studying diet, we knew that this was something we could go in and do right away. We didn't have to apply for FDA approval for a drug before we could do a human study. We could just start doing human dietary interventions, longitudinally monitoring the immune system and the microbiome and starting to put the pieces together of what is it in diet that can change our microbiome in a healthy way, help us define what a healthy microbiome is and monitor the immune system in great detail. And so there were really two critical components of this in addition to our microbiome expertise. One was Christopher Gardner's group. Um, we wanted to do these human studies, but we're absolutely terrified of humans. We work with mice. Humans are terrifying um, in many ways. But they but, house themselves. You don't have to pay, that, you don't have to pay for their housing. That, that's yeah. true. Yeah. For those that can afford housing, of course. Yeah. <laughs> for, for, yeah. For, yeah, sadly, just for that portion of the population. The... Um, so, so Christopher's group were they were our masters at working with human populations, and then the other wonderful thing that we have at Stanford is this Human Immune Monitoring Center um, run by Mark Davis and Holden Maker. They started this beautiful center for allowing people to do immunology in humans. Critical element because a lot of the mouse studies don't translate well to humans. So, if you can do the studies in humans, uh, similar to how we were thinking about the microbiome you learn something that you know is relevant to humans. And so having that immune profiling capability where we can monitor, you know, hundreds to thousands different of different parameters in the immune system longitudinally in people from a blood draw and not just know if CRP goes up or if interleukin-6 goes up or down, but to be able to see all these facets of the immune system change in concert as we're changing the microbiome with diet was really a key component of this. And so our flagship study supported by wonderful donors um, so this actually isn't funded by typical foundations and National Institutes of Health. It was funded by um, philanthropy. We wanted to understand if we put people on a high fiber diet, um, how would that affect their microbiome and immune system? And if we put them on a high fermented food diet, a diet rich in live microbes and all the metabolites that um, are present from fermentation and foods, how would that change microbiome and immune system? Could you give us some examples of what those diets look like? And were you changing their basal diet? Or were you just adding things on top of what they were already eating? So because uh, it's hard to change people's diets, it's, and, it's and very hard to trust that they actually do it, and they're not sneaking and uh, totally, yeah. And so, so we um, and you know we've started the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford for doing a lot of these studies, and a portion of the studies we do focus on supplements, probiotics, uh, microbes delivered in pill form, prebiotics, which are um, purified forms of fiber. And in those cases, we actually can have placebo groups um, because you know it's it's more like a drug study, and um, we don't change people's diets, so we can just administer this on top of what they're doing. So in a way, they're a lot more controlled, but it's not food. When you start doing food studies, you can't do a placebo group because people know what they're eating. And the other problem is that um, it's really hard to just change one thing because as soon as you start adding something 
people usually eliminate something else. So the idea was to basically give these people simple instructions for, in the case of the high fiber diet, just increasing plant-based fiber. So can you eat more whole grains, more legumes, more vegetables, nuts, get the fiber up in the range of, you know, from 15 to 20 grams per day up to over 40 grams per day. So can you kind of double or more the amount of fiber that you eat per day, knowing that that would have a tremendous impact on a lot of other facets of their um, diet. They um, eat less um, uh, meat, animal-based protein, um, less animal-based fats as a product of this. Um, You know, I will say that uh, getting back to the, you know, Christopher's rule for a healthy diet, um, a lot of the macronutrient changes that we saw in their diet were consistent with um, healthy changes in diet, less saturated fat, less animal-based protein, more plant-based protein. So a lot of changes that are known to be beneficial kind of came in concert with just telling people eat a high fiber diet, high plant-based uh, fiber diet. Um, the people that were eating the high fermented food uh, diet, um, they were instructed to basically eat um, you know, foods that you could buy at a grocery store that were naturally fermented and contain live microbes. And so this, you know, largely consisted of yogurt, uh, kefir, uh, sauerkraut, kimchi, um, you know, some fermented vegetables, um, kind of brine fermented vegetables, pickles. pickles, things like that. But but they do, you know, one of the things that I think is a pitfall in, in choosing fermented foods is, you know, you can go down the canned food aisle and there's this huge set section of pickles and jars that are canned, um, those are not fermented foods. Those are are cucumbers that they've put in acetic acid and vinegar to reconstitute that fermented flavor, but there's no live microbes involved in that. And even sauerkrauts in the canned food aisle, even if they were naturally fermented, quite often they're not, quite often they're just brined um, in, in vinegar. But even if they are naturally fermented, all the microbes are killed prior to canning or during the process of canning. And so if you want to, so what we use for this study, and if you want to have live fermented foods that contain live microbes, you need to buy those out of the um, the f- uh, refrigerated section, essentially. And I'm really glad you pointed this out uh, because uh, you can find sauerkraut on the non-fermented, uh, non-refrigerated shelf uh, that is indeed non-fermented. Um, a lot of fermented foods that are available in the U.S. Um, uh, can be high in sugar. Um, so was there any instruction as to, you know, getting people to make sure that they were consuming yogurts that weren't loaded with sugar? Yep. Or, or did you let them just select for the the, the stuff in the cold the yeah. cold section that is fermented? No, it's, yeah. it's a super important point. We, we instructed people to eat non-sweetened yogurts. Right. Um, the, you know, it's, I think, a huge pitfall in this area is you can have a yogurt loaded with bacteria, kind of the base of what's healthy, and then a ton of like artificial flavoring and sugar loaded on top of that. Manufacturers put a ton of sugar in after the fact to kind of mask the sour taste of fermented foods, which is hard for some people to become accustomed to. When we were switching to more fermented foods, our daughters were young at that point, we would take, you know, plain yogurt, which um, they didn't like, just kind of neat. Um, we would mix in like a little maple syrup or honey, um, just a little bit. And gradually we reduce that over time to the point where um, their palate adjusted and now they just really like plain um, yogurt. But it is, you know, I think getting used to that sour flavor is is difficult, but people really should try to stay away from those um, fermented foods that are loaded with sugar. And that's what we instructed people in this study. And beer was not included, right? Beer, the the yeah. number of people that asked when I, I did a brief uh, thing on social media about this study, and uh, hopefully I got it right. I, I think I did. Um, but people just ask about beer. I'm not a drinker. So um, for yeah. me, beer has no appeal anyway. Um, yeah. But uh Beer is fermented, (laughs) correct? Um, But were they instructed to avoid beer or to drink beer? Just to go with their normal dietary habits, but that did not count as a a fermented food. And kombucha was, as I kombucha was, and kombucha can have small amounts of alcohol in it. Um, But uh, you know, um, we yeah, kombucha actually was one of the major things that people drank during the or consumed during the fermented food phase. And um, the you know the the deal with with uh, beer is that th- there may be beneficial properties of the microbial communities in naturally fermented beer, but most of the beer that we buy, again, is canned and filtered 
and there's no live microbes there. So very different than if you, you know, siphon it off of your home brew and drink it probably than right. if you buy it in a store. I just, I, w- I will get to the results of the study in just one moment, but I want to say a, a lot of people shy away from the high quality fermented foods because they, they can be quite costly. Um, I'll just refer people to a, a resource in Tim Ferriss's book, The 4-Hour Chef. He actually gives an excellent recipe for making your own sauerkraut, which basically um, involves cabbage and water and salt, but you have to do it properly because you can grow some, um, not necessarily uh, lethal, but some d- somewhat dangerous bacteria if you don't scrape off the top layer properly. But he gives beautiful instructions for how to do this in vats. We've started doing this at home now, yeah, actually, as we get the, which is a ceramic vat. And you can, so you can make large amounts of truly fermented sauerkraut just from cabbage, water, and salt, if you're willing to follow the protocol. And if you're interested in science, that protocol looks a lot like what you'll do for most of your graduate career, except maybe some sequencing too. <laughs> right. So anyway, just to refer people to a source that's very low cost yeah. compared to buying the high quality fermented foods, even kombuchas. For some people, you know, it's like $5 a bottle and totally. you know, only yeah. this much. And if you consume liquids the way I consume them, that's kind of a, that's uh, just a, the the start. So, yeah. Um, and, but, you know, if you can get your hands on a SCOBY, kombucha is another one that's super simple. It's you like, can grow your own. You can, you can just make your own and it's super easy to do. I make it, I constantly have a batch of kombucha going at home and it's just, you know, it's this, it's a SCOBY, a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast that you, you know, you, you brew tea, you add sugar to it and you put the SCOBY in and you wait a week or two, depending upon the temperature and you then you just you know move the scoby over to a new batch and you your old you know, what the scoby was in is kombucha and it's it's wonderful i love it i, I would love it if yeah. members of this audience would um start to make their own kombucha yeah. and sauerkraut i i've been having so much fun well, i don't do it but um you know uh it's done in our home um yeah. <laughs> i don't i don't go anywhere near the food production and it's, it's for everyone's benefit um so how much fermented food and then uh, were they consuming? And because you mentioned the number of grams approximately of, of fiber and, uh, but was it in servings, ounces, um, how many times a day, early day, late day? Right. Yeah. So um, the uh, we had a, a wonderful dietitian instructing people for this and uh, her name's Dahlia Perlman and she really was the key and is the key for many of our studies for getting people to eat differently. And um you know, I, the general instructions were for people to eat as much fermented foods as possible, more is better. And uh, the, the reason is that with this initial study, we really wanted to maximize our chance of seeing a signal if there was something biological going on with the idea that if we, you know, the dose was excessive and not easily achievable by a lot of people in the end, we can go back and, and say, okay, this, this is the point at which we lose the biological signal. Um, but people um, during the height of the intervention phase, the intervention phase was six weeks, um, during the height of that, we're up over six servings on average per day of fermented foods. So kind of two servings at each meal. And the uh, you know ounces or weight or size, de- it really depended on what the fermented food was. And we just told them to stick to what was a recommended dose on the the package that they were they were buying. You know, for kombucha, it'd be like a six to eight ounce glass um, sauerkraut, like a half cup or something like that. And same with yogurt. Great. So, what what were the results? Yeah. So the the results um, astounded us in a way, but then thinking more deeply and it'll be evident even after I explain it in the context of this conversation, likely why we saw the results we saw. Um, The results were astounding because um, our hypothesis going into this was that the high fiber diet was going to give the massive signal. We know that this is the big deficiency in the Western diet. Um, We, uh, all the mouse studies have told us that high fiber really leads to a much healthier microbiota can lead to positive changes in the immune system. And in fact, even when we had a limited, you know, we had wonderful donor support, but still a limited amount of money. When we started this study, um, my lab was really very eager to do the high fiber um, part of this really well. And Christopher kind of had to twist our arms to do the fermented food side of it. And we thought it was kind of quirky and neat, like live microbes should be exciting. Like, let's try it. So we put that in and it turns out that we were very thankful that he twisted our arms because it was that um, high fermented food arm that really gave us the big signal. Even though our hypothesis was that the high fiber was going to lead to more short chain fatty acids produced in the gut, uh, more diverse microbiota, um, less inflammation in the immune system, we didn't see that across the cohort. We actually saw very 
individualized responses to the dietary fiber. And I'll come back to what those responses were. The The big signal really was in the fermented food group. We saw all the things that you would hope to see in a Western microbiota and Western human. We saw this increase in microbiota diversity over the course of the six weeks while they were consuming the fermented foods. Um, and we can't always say that um, higher diversity is better when it comes to our microbial communities. We know there are cases, for instance, bacterial vaginosis where higher diversity is actually indicative of a disease state. Um, but we um, know in the context of the gut and for people living in the industrialized world, higher diversity is generally better. Um, we know that there's a spectrum of diversity. People with higher diversity generally are health healthier. If you can push your diversity higher, you're in better shape. And so we saw that increase in diversity. And then the major question is what happened to the immune system as these people were increasing their gut microbiota diversity through the fermented foods. Um, we, so we did the, um, this massive immune profiling and we see you know, a couple dozen immune markers, inflammatory markers decrease over the course of the study. So we, multi we uh, measure these at multiple time points throughout the course of the study. And there's kind of this step stepwise reduction in things like interleukin-6 and, um, you know, uh, uh, interleukin-12, a variety of kind of famous inflammatory mediators. Um, and then even if you go into the immune cells and you start looking at their signaling cascades, we see that those signaling cascades are less activated at the end of the study compared to the beginning of the study, indicating an attenuation of inflammation. So, so kind of exactly what we would hypothesize would lead to less propensity for inflammatory disease over time. That's a, a huge extension of a very short study. And How long was the study again? So the, the complete protocol, I think, was 14 to 17 weeks or something like that. The actual intervention phase consisted of a four-week ramp and then a six-week maintenance period. So the intervention itself was 10 weeks, but there were six weeks of really kind of hardcore high levels of, of fiber or fermented foods. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you mentioned the ramp because my experience with um, fermented foods is that you it can be beneficial to give the system an opportunity to acclimate. I mean, if you consume a giant bowl of sauerkraut, um, it's not gonna be the worst day and night of your life, but you'll, you'll, you'll know you did. Um, totally. We'll just leave it at that. And so you wanna kind of acclimate to it. Um, I'm, I'm at the point now where people, some people might think this is gross, but I, after I um, exercise, I've been sweating a lot. I like the saltiness of the, I actually drink the, uh, the liquid that the, that the sauerkraut has been um, stewing in. And I get, I like to think that I consume some uh, fer fermentation that way. It's salty. It acts as kind of a, a post-training uh, replenishment. But if I had done that um, six months ago, straight off, I think it, it would have been pretty rough on my system. I started taking little bits of it and then adding it each day. Totally. And so both with the fermented foods and the fiber, it's well known that that this kind of gradual ramping is a really important way of mitigating um, bloating and other kind of digestive discomfort that can happen when your microbiome reconfigures and starts fermenting more and changing community members. So um, you should take that ramp at your own pace. If something seems to be going wrong, just kind of level off, stay there. You know, we, we did this in a very delicate way to get people up to the high dose. The um, Brian question, just a, um, a, a tangent here for a second, um, that was actually one of the products that we um, had people use in the fermented food phase. There's actually a product called Gut Shots, which mm -hmm. is just the brine from mm -hmm. that they've marketed. Um, we actually are now studying it in the lab. I just actually, before this came from a lab meeting where a, a GI fellow in my lab is actually putting Gut Shots sterilized gut microbe or the ferment, fermented um, uh, fermentation microbes removed or present into mice and looking at changes in their mucosal immune system. So we're studying this in detail now because this is it's a rich source of lactate and a bunch of other interesting metabolites. I love that my weird behavior is uh, inadvertently being studied uh, at Stanford Medicine. Um, I want to just mention something about the the, the gut shots. Um, those are are sold as a as a drink. Those also, just for certain listeners in different budgets, they can be very expensive if you really think about. Some of them are exceedingly expensive. But the, what I described before with making your own um, kombuchas, it's not quite brining, but the um, homemade sauerkraut, uh, that protocol is out there, as I mentioned in, in Tim's book, The, the Four-Hour Chef. And you get a lot of the brining from, from that, an almost endless amount. Um, a cautionary note, I once um, went into the refrigerator and, and saw something similar to gut shot. It wasn't gut shot. 
and I drank the whole 12 ounce bottle and realized that it was 24 servings. And that's where <laughs> I got my initial um, experience with what it is to not do a ramp up phase. Yeah. I do not recommend doing that. Some of these, it's very potent, it seems, and you can consume, you know, even a half an ounce or an ounce. It's, yeah, it's very, quite, I mean, low. very potent from the standpoint of fermentation, but also very salty. So, yeah. you know, there, there's a lot of effects yeah. that can, yeah. yeah don't do what I yeah, do, um, at least not at the outset. And, um, uh, but so that is a, a an experienced <laughs> warning. So they did this, as I recall, there was a swap condition or there was a halt condition. So you did controls, right? It wasn't just comparing groups. You had individuals um, in, who were initially in one group or the other um, move to a different group. Correct? Well, so we it, for, or so, to stop and then return. Yeah, we we actually just did a stop and followed them during a washout phase. And I the ideal situation for. Um, dietary interventions like this are to do um, crossover studies, as you're suggesting. We've um, recently completed a ketogenic versus Mediterranean diet intervention. Oh, where those data we, published yet? Um, not yet, but Christopher has been tweeting a lot of these data and there's oh. a paper in revision right now. So if you go to Christopher Gardner's um, tw Twitter feed, you'll be able to find him reporting some of the the early results of, of oh, this study. Can you give us a snippet of, was there a superior, just give us a, you don't have to tell us which one, but um, was there a superior uh, condition of either Mediterranean versus ketogenic? So um, so I should, the metabolic effects of these, um, it's a beautiful study. I should let his group comment okay. on that. The microbiota data we actually are just generating now. So the, the study that he's his group has put together from this is, um, largely independent of the microbiota right. data. And now we're doing a more in-depth analysis and I'll have more to say about that in the future. Yeah. But we'll that, return to that. Yeah. But, it, but it's a super exciting study because it is one of these where people eat a certain way. And what's really beautiful about this is we even got food delivered for part of the um, intervention. So we had complete control over what they at least had available to eat. Um, and then the second phase, they... Um, they um, make the food on their own. And then we cross over and do the same thing. And so that's really like the, um, if you have a, a good enough budget, the right way to do a study like this. For this, we didn't have the um, the time or, or money to do a crossover, but we did do a washout phase where people, we didn't make them stop eating whatever, if they were enjoying it, but we monitored and there was some recidivism where there was a decrease in fiber or fermented food. And we could see, for instance, diversity start to plateau and reverse in many of these people. So there does appear to be like a, a need for maintenance of the intervention to maintain the perceived health benefits that we were measuring. Great. Uh, we will provide a link to the study in the caption. And thank you for that very clear and thorough description. Um, from the invest, one of the investigators involved in the study, that all, it's great to go direct to the source. Um, anecdotally, were there improvements in mood, in um, resistance to colds and infection um, during the course of the study? And this is uh, kind of a prelude to where I'm headed next, which is there is a tremendous amount of interest in the so-called gut-brain axis. But also, I want to make sure that we talk about how these microbes and the conditions they're establishing in the gut are creating positive or negative health effects. I mean, actually, basically how signals get out of the gut. Totally. Um, yeah. So did people, I certainly notice that when I'm eating more fermented foods or there's probiotics in some, in drinks I consume and so forth, that I feel, quote unquote, air quotes, completely subjective, I feel better. Yeah. Um, I, I wish there was an objective measure of feeling better. Um, yeah. But I seem to think more clearly, sleep better, mood, et cetera. And I know I'm not alone in that. Um, and people, and anytime I've taken harsh antibiotics, I feel worse. But then again, I'm usually taking them because I'm feeling bad about something else, right? Yeah, I don't take yeah. them just because. So did people say they were feeling better um, in any way? And if so, what did you observe? And again, we're highlighting these as anic data. As, um, yeah, totally. Um, you know, we, um, as, as part of this effort um, to look at how dietary inter interventions uh, affect our, our health and well-being and so forth and microbiome and immune system, um, we, uh, interact with a lot of people who have like read our book or, you know, kind of have become microbiome enthusiasts and have implemented a lot of these changes in their personal life. And I hear the same thing that, that you're saying, Andrew, that, the, you know, tons of people say they have more energy, they think more clearly, they sleep better, their family is nicer to each other, like the number of crazy things. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to uncouple, like, is this because, you know, these people have taken charge now of what they're eating and just feel better in general for being in control of kind of what they're doing? Or is there this cascading um, set of effects that are actually 
you know, impacting our, our you know, kind of emanating from the gut brain axis. And, and so we actually implemented a bunch of questionnaires and even a cognitive test to try to get at some of this. And, and I should say, you know, the, the list of this goes on and on. There are people who claim that their complexion improves and that their, you know, allergies, and there's probably all sorts of ripple effects. If you can affect your inflammation, you can, we know that you can affect your cognition. We know that you can affect your, you know, your, your skin and, and inflammation that's occurring on your skin. So, so I really think that there is a basis for a lot of those anecdotes. It may just be hard to see in a short study and in um, a small, you know, a small cohort of people over a short period of time. But we didn't really see significant things associated with cognition and moods and, you know, all of the things that that um, we were testing for, which, um, yeah, there, there could be a variety of explanations for that. The You know, we also have a, um, a standardized... Um, uh, stool measure that people use. And there was, um, you know, kind of less constipation, better bowel movements over the course of both of these interventions. So it did seem like bowel habits improved, mm -hmm. which um, a lot of times can lead to better moods, but that we weren't able to, to measure that. The classic psychoanalysts would have a, a field day with that. Yeah. Um, what sorts of interesting things did you observe in the fiber group? Because it's clear that that group um, yielded some unexpected findings in both directions that you, things you expected to see, you didn't see as to the same amplitude as you did in the fermented food group. But I'm guessing you also saw some very interesting things in the fiber group. To totally. Yeah. So, um, so we started looking at the data in more detail when we didn't see the cohort wide um, response. And um, one of the things we observed is that in measuring all these immune parameters, there appeared to be three different groups of kind of immune responses that we were seeing one group that got overall less inflammatory, and then two other groups that kind of had a mixed result, partly more inflammatory, partly less inflammatory in all these markers that we were looking at. And when we started digging into like what um, aspect of the you know biology of those people dictated or predicted which group they fell into, the really interesting part is the people with the highest diversity got microbiomes to start the study were the ones that were most likely to have the um, decreases in inflammation. And so uh, the you know data seemed to be telling us that if you start off with a diverse microbiota, maybe one that's better equipped to degrade a wide variety of, of dietary fiber, you're more likely to respond positively to it. If you have a very depleted gut microbiome, you're not as likely to be able to respond to it. And thinking back to that experiment that we talked about before with the multi-generational loss of, of fiber-fermenting microbes in, in mice that were fed uh, a Western diet, um, it, it may be that uh, many of us in the industrialized world have a microbiome that's so depleted now that even if we consume a high-fiber diet, at least for a short period of time, we don't have the right microbes in our gut to degrade that fiber and this has actually been observed by other groups, beautiful study out of University of Minnesota, looking at immigrants coming to the United States. And, you know, within nine months, but certainly over the course of years, immigrants that come here lose um, a, a lot of the diversity in their gut microbiome, but a lot of the fiber degrading capacity in their gut microbiome too. So it could be that over time, this becomes a one-way street and it's hard for us to recover um, the, the microbes that that actually can degrade the fiber. And I think that this probably intersects with sanitation in our environment and the fact that we don't have access to new microbes that might help us degrade the fiber, that we actually um, you know, have lost these microbes and they're in some ways irrecoverable without deliberate reintroduction of fiber-degrading microbes. I can recall from childhood there were kids that would eat dirt. Yeah and snails and stuff right. that just sounds totally disgusting, but, you know, kids covered with mud and, um, you know, that maybe not so much anymore. And, and certainly during the pandemic, there's been a lot more um, use of these hand sanitizers that prior to that people seemed pretty spooked about, but then obviously the, they prioritize them. Um, so it, do you, well, you have children, did you, do you encourage them to, uh, to, when they were young, did you encourage them to interact with pets and dirt and Absolutely. Um, yeah. stuff in the environment, provided that stuff wasn't immediately toxic. Yeah, exactly. So this is really, you know, it's it's a continual um, cost-benefit analysis, I think. The, um, 
I, I will say that, you know, with the pandemic now and um, certainly just with infectious diseases in general, it's really important to be aware of, um, you know, the the possibility for compromising your health through the spread of germs. And so that that is just, you know, hand washing is important and we have to be careful with, you know, um, the, the spread of germs. But I do think that, um, you know, the sanitation, sanitization of our environment um, has gone overboard with the, you know, um, various things being impregnated with antibiotics, you know, shopping carts and things like that and toothbrushes. And, you know, it's, it's like antibiotics and, and, um, you know, things for killing microbes are, are everywhere. And when we were raising, you know, when our daughters were young and we were, we were making these decisions, the calculations that we would make were really, um, one, uh, how likely are they to encounter a disease causing microbe? If we've been out, you know, on a hike or in our garden, you know, just kind of working in the dirt or whatever, maybe it's not as important to wash your hands before you have lunch, even if there's a little bit of dirt on them. Um, if they've been in a public playground where maybe there's um, other kids with germs or maybe even chemicals like pesticides and, and herbicides that are being used, um, it, maybe it's more important than to wash your hands. You know, certainly if you've been in the grocery store or on the subway, probably a good idea to wash your hands. But I, so I think you really need to think about kind of the the context of it and um, it, exposure to microbes uh, from the environment is likely an important part of um, educating our immune system and keeping the proper balance in our immune system. And it's just a matter of figuring out the right way to do that safely. And it may be that the fermented food result that we saw is a way of tapping into those same pathways, kind of an environmental exposure to microbes that's safe. Interesting. I'd like to touch on how signals get from the gut to the rest of the body. And uh, we probably don't have time to go into all the systems that benefit from having a diverse microbiome or a healthy microbiome, but uh, we talked about the immune system. Um, there's active signaling and transport from the gut all along its length, as far as I know, into the bloodstream and to other organs and tissues. So for the immune system, um, it seems straightforward. Um, you could reduce the, the amount or number of inflammatory cytokines like IL-6 and so forth, maybe increase the anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10 um, and others. But uh, we know there's a gut-brain axis of neurons that literally talk in both directions between brain and gut. But let's say I, I'm eating my fermented foods, I'm doing all the right things, and I, my gut is diverse, and I have all the good goodies at all the right places. How is it that, uh, that the fact that those microbiota are thriving is conveyed to the rest of the body? Um, because they're in there doing their thing, and I don't know that they have a mind, but they're probably not thinking of taking care of me, Andrew. But I get feel better, or I might uh, get sick less often, or combat um, any illness more quickly. How is that actually happening? Yeah. I mean, is it is it that the microbiota stay restricted to the, the gut, but the signaling molecules are all downstream, um, in a downstream way, are, are making good or bad things happen? Or is there some sort of direct recognition at the body level? Or are there cells in the body that are responding to, ah, the gut microbiome is healthy, and therefore I can make more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff, yeah. so to speak? Yeah, great. The, I, um, you're right. It's super complex. There's a huge array of ways that our body um, perceives um, both the microbes and the molecules that they produce in our gut. And the molecules they produce are, of course, a product of what microbes are there and then what they receive as kind of metabolic inputs, what we're eating and what other microbes are, are present in the environment providing molecules to them. So, you know, it's this complex matrix, but we, you know, the um, probably the the simplest place to start is just the immune system. We have um, an immune system that, you know, the vast majority of immune cells in our body are located in our gut just because there's such a, a dense um, population of microbes there that have, you know, they're, they're um, we consider them um, beneficial microbes, but they're only beneficial if they're in the right spot in the gut. As soon as they mislocalize, we know that they be can become opportunistic pathogens. And so the immune system really playing an important role to keep them in place is essential for the system not um, moving into a disease space. The immune system has a variety of ways of, of monitoring what microbes are there. There are actually specialized structures in the gut um, known as pyre, pyres patches that actually take up microbes. They, they actually allow microbes to transit into this population of immune cells 
in a very controlled way so that that set of immune cells becomes educated as to what microbes are just on the other side of the barrier. Wow. It's so, like a kind of like a border patrol. I- exactly. Yeah. So they, they bring them in, they, they, you know, fingerprint them and then, um, you know, have, have kind of this, um, you know, set of responses ready to go if needed. Amazing. Um, there, there are other cells known as dendritic cells, special types that actually send uh, long arms, these processes out into the lumen of the gut and do the same thing, take up microbes, bring them back in and sample them. Um, in addition to these direct sampling mechanisms, the cells that line the gut have a, a huge array of receptors, specialized proteins that perceive patterns that the um, molecular patterns that the um, microbes make. So things like endotoxin, lipopolysaccharide, um, just the cell wall of the um, bacteria. We have specialized receptors that recognize those. If those signals become too profound or if they're perceived in the wrong place, that can stimulate an inflammatory response. So there's all these ways of kind of monitoring the membership and where it is and how close it is. But then there's this whole other set of um, ways of perceiving metabolic activity and what's happening in the gut. And you mentioned before this direct, um, you know, these cell types that um, express taste receptors in the gut and have ways of sampling dietary components. They're the same types of um, or a- analogous cells in our gut that are perceiving metabolites produced by the microbiota so that um, our bodies can perceive what sort of metabolic activity is going on. And then, you know, in addition to that, there's this tremendous, uh, tremendously important enteric nervous system that's um, sending signals back to the brain, dictating things like um, motility. Do I get rid of what's in here? Do I move it along quickly? What what actually is is happening? Do I need to interact with immune cells? So there's this really complex array of, of um, interactions between the different cell types. And then a lot of the cells that are in the gut perceiving all of these signals, a lot of the immune cells can actually get up and leave. They can, you know, get into the blood, cycle through and, and then home to other regions of the um, mucosal surfaces so that mucosal surfaces are, are um, educated broadly against what's, um, what's passing through our gut. So there's, there's a um, variety of ways of cells communicating. And then a lot of the molecules that the microbiota makes can actually make their way into the bloodstream directly. And, and so, you know, the, um, the array of molecules is still being defined. We're trying to figure out um, what all these chemicals are. We've mentioned the short chain fatty acids, but those are just the tip of the iceberg. They're really interesting compounds like, um, you know, indole derivatives and um, phenols and and, you know, derived from amino acids, metabolized by gut microbes, taken up into the bloodstream. And then we further metabolize these. They become kind of co-microbe host metabolites. And then they can go on and bind to different receptors throughout our body, anywhere our bloodstream has access to, and start to trigger signaling cascades. Is it known whether or not any of those molecules are small enough to cross the blood-brain barrier? Because the hypothesis it, uh, and the current thinking is that um, neurotransmitters manufactured in the gut and signaling along the gut-brain axis, literally neurons talking back and forth electrically from brain to gut and gut to brain, is what regulates things like mood or at least in animal models. And there are some emerging human studies, improvement of symptoms in, in um, autism spectrum disorders, maybe even in ADHD. What I'm basically saying here is there there is some evidence um, emerging that improving the gut microbiome can improve um, outcomes in psychiatric and developmental disorders. But what you're telling me is that the, that the microbiota themselves are manufacturing chemicals that can make it into the bloodstream. And therefore I'm asking if those chemicals can move from the bloodstream into the brain directly, it may not be a gut brain access via neurons. It actually could just be seepage of serotonin into the brain and, uh, or to- acetylcholine into the brain for, for that matter. Totally. Yeah. And you know, the, um, the, Vast, the, the biology of most of these molecules is not well understood, but certainly in like cerebrospinal fluid that's been analyzed, um, it's you, you can perceive these microbial metabolites. So they are there. That's the answer. Well, yeah. yeah. Some, some of them are getting across the barrier. But, but so a really interesting thing is I think a lot of these molecules are um, 
if they're experienced at high enough doses are um, toxic or have toxic properties. We know that um, a lot of these um, metabolites, when they make their way into the bloodstream, eventually are excreted through the kidneys and urine. So actually we can monitor the metabolism that's going on in your gut by actually looking at the metabolites that are present in your urine because those many of those originated in your gut from your gut microbes. But people with kidney disease, the, whose kidneys um, filtering process is not functioning properly, actually um, build up high levels of many of these metabolites into the bloodstream. And um, that can lead to more of these molecules making it across the blood-brain barrier. And in fact, some of the um, transporters in the kidney that are responsible for shuttling these molecules out into urine are also found at the blood-brain barrier for shuttling the molecules back into the bloodstream if they do get across. Incredible. And, and we know that like mental fog is a big, one of the big symptoms of kidney disease, potentially because a lot of these metabolites accumulate in blood and then make their way across the blood-brain barrier into yeah, this central nervous system. Amazing. I'm glad you mentioned mental fog. A few years back, there were some uh, reports uh, some scientific reports and as a consequence in, in the media that um, excessive intake of, pro of pill form probiotics could create mental fog. I don't know if that ever took hold. Um, and I, it raises a general question about um, pill form probiotics. Uh, I took them for a few years just thinking that would be good for my gut microbiome. And then I switched to the fermented food thing largely um, as a consequence of uh, the work that you and Chris published. Um, but uh, what, what's the thought about probiotics for, for the typical person that's not recovering from a round of antibiotics or right. that um, has been prescribed them? Um, I've heard that the species of um, microbiota that they um, proliferate might not be the species that we want to proliferate, but I've also heard that maybe that doesn't matter. So what, what's your general stance? They can be quite expensive yeah. um, also. I know I've been talking about expense a lot today, but I always want to take into account that people are showing up to the table at a, with a variety of budgets. And, you know, probiotics are one of the more expensive supplements out there. You can quickly get into the several hundreds of dollars yeah. per month if you're getting the uh, quote unquote best quality ones. Right. And if they're actually causing brain fog, then I'm not yeah. sure I'd want to use them. No, completely. And there's a ton of snake oil out there. I mean, there's just people know that they, you know, I think the uh, many of these companies are aware that they can prey off of people's fears and get a lot of money from them with absolutely no data to back up that their probiotic is doing anything. Um, the, so I think the, the first thing to say is buyer beware because it's a supplement market. It's largely unregulated. And that means that there are a lot of bad products out there and a lot of products that um, even though they're not intended to be bad, just don't have great quality control. There have been several studies that have taken off the uh, over the counter, just kind of off the shelf probiotics, surveyed what's in there based on sequencing and shown that they what is in there does not match what's on the label. Yeah. So that's, and that's true of many supplements and unfortunately supplement companies. This is something we get into on the podcast a lot. There there are reputable brands and they go through a lot of work to to get things right. And there are many that just for whatever reason it just doesn't match what's listed. Exactly. And so there there are um uh, places that probiotic companies can send their product to have it independently validated. So you want to look for that sort of validation on the, on a product. Um, there also are names that are just very well known and, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, their reputations are on the line. So they probably invest a little bit more in quality control than maybe some of the other lesser known names. Um, but, you know, there's, there's a huge range of, um, data, on probiotics. And I think, you know, the, the thing that we kind of recommend is, you know, um, try to find good products and then experiment for yourself and see if you can find something that works for you. I know people who have experienced, you know, constipation and, um, you know, can't, don't want to change their diet and have found a probiotic that helps them with that. Um, if you can find that right mix, great, you know, that that's wonderful. Um, I would say that the, the data right now is not, um, overwhelmingly positive for what probiotics do to the gut microbiota. So there have been some nice studies looking at the impact of probiotics on recovery after antibiotic treatment, and it appears to slow down the recovery of the mucosal microbiota. Um, and uh, some some other studies that have um, where where the the big signal isn't seen 
as you might hope with a, a probiotic that's supposed to treat a different disease. There have been meta-analysis that do suggest in certain instances recovery from um, uh, uh, antibiotics that they're, even though it may cause your microbiota to recover more slowly, that it may actually prevent uh, diarrheal disease, recovery from viral diarrheas, mm -hmm. probiotics may help. But because there's such a huge range of products and because each person is their own little caper when it comes to the microbiome, it's really hard to know um, whether there are great products for a given indication. The really good advice that I've heard is try to find um, uh, a study that supports in you know a really well designed study, and this is very hard for people who aren't scientists to evaluate. But so you know, if you're experiencing a medical problem or want to consult a doctor, um, the you know that that might be helpful. But finding a study where a specific probiotic has successfully done whatever it is you're looking for, and then sticking with that probiotic is really the best recipe for as a, as a place to start in this space, I think. And what about prebiotics? Because there are a number of um, reasons why I can imagine that prebiotics would be beneficial, um, which essentially it's, you're, you're pushing the fiber system, which we talked a lot about today. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, <clears throat> the studies that have been done <clears throat> on prebiotics, the, it's really kind of a, a mixed bag of results. The, um, there have been studies done with um, purified fibers where you actually see microbiota diversity plummet over the course of the study because um, you get a very specific bloom in a small number of bacteria that are good at using that one type of fiber. And that's at the expense of all the other microbes that are in the gut. And so, um, so it's really hard to replicate with purified fiber what you'd get, for instance, at a salad bar in terms of the array of complex carbohydrates that you would be exposing your microbiota to. And I think the kind of um, uh, broad view of this in the field is that consuming a broad variety of plants is uh, and and all the the diverse fiber that comes with that is probably better in fostering diversity in your microbiota than purified fibers. Now, there are, um, again, a lot of people who benefit from purified fibers, either for GI motility um, or, or for other aspects of, of GI health problems that they've been experiencing. Again, I think it's the type of thing where you have to um, try to find the thing that that's right for you. But there, um, there also are studies that suggest that if you layer rapidly fermentable um, fibers on top of a Western diet, you actually can um, result in in weird metabolism happening in your liver because you have this incredibly rapid fermentation of fiber along with a lot of fat um, coming into the system. At least that's the that's the theory. And in a mouse study that was published a few years ago, they actually see that a subset of the mice develop hepatocellular carcinoma when they're fed a, a high dose prebiotic liver cancer, liver cancer yeah. on top of a, um, on top of a Western diet. So. Whether that's representative of human biology, we don't know. But um, you know, purified fibers are definitely very different, um, both in terms of the diversity of structures, but also in terms of how rapidly they're fermented in the gut. Because um, you know, if you are eating plants, the complex structures there really slow the microbes down in terms of fermentation, and you end up with a slow rate of fermentation over the length of your colon, as opposed to this big burst of fermentation that can happen if you eat something that is highly soluble and, and easily accessed by the microbes. Interesting. So I guess, uh, is it fair to come back to this idea, um, try and avoid processed foods, the highly palatable foods, they're all sometimes super highly palatable foods, they're now called that are packed with hidden sugars, emulsifiers. So um, it sounds like some fiber is good. Um, and despite the outcome of the study, you identified that if you have the appropriate microbiota, then you will um, background, then one will respond even better to the fiber, maybe a longer ramp up phase for, for those right. folks. And then the fermented foods, because there's no reason why you can't do both. And as we've talked about before, um, a lot of fermented foods have fiber, so you can right. kill two birds with one stone. Totally, and, and it could be that the diversity increase that we saw in the high fermented food group could be something that would aid the high fiber group. And so now we're planning another study coming up where we're doing high fiber, high fermented food, and then fiber plus fermented food just to see if there's a synergistic effect there. Great, I want to enroll. Uh, seriously. <laughs> Although I guess I'm biased because I sort of know where you're trying to, what, uh, well, it'll, is it blood draws that you use to measure the inflammatome? I, um, exactly. So we do okay, blood well, draws well, like blood every draws two weeks. Blood draws don't lie. So yeah, that's yeah, good. Right. So you've covered 
a tremendous amount of information and I'm incredibly grateful. This was a area of biology that despite having learned a lot about through papers and going to talks and, and reading articles in the media has remained somewhat mysterious to me until today. You've given us a very vivid picture of how this system works. Where can people find out more about the work that you're doing? Uh, we can certainly provide links. And, uh, and you and, and your wife, uh, who co-run your lab, you have a book on this topic. So could you tell us about the book where we can learn more about the Sonnenberg Lab and the work that you're doing? Um, maybe people will even try and enroll in some of these studies. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, it'd be great if we could get people to en enroll. We're always looking for, um, for you know, willing participants. Um, yeah, so uh, Erica, my wife, and I wrote a book called The Good Gut. And um, that, that really was a um, response to how we were changing our lives in response to, to being in the field, being very familiar with the research, seeing that a lot of our friends that weren't studying the gut microbiome, but were very well informed, many of them scientists, were not doing the same things we were doing. And it was very clear that it was just the um, lack of information funneling out of the field to other people. And so we wanted to um, make that accessible to people who are not microbiome scientists. There's also a really interesting story. We were at a, a conference site that just has scientific conferences all summer long, week after week after week, different fields. And so it's people that work there that are just dealing with these new groups coming in week after week. And the week we were there for a microbiome conference, uh, people um, uh, that work in the dining commons came up to us and they said, what group is this? This is weird. And we're, we're like, what's weird? And they said, we can't keep the salad bar stocked. And it was just, it was very clear that nobody was doing what we were doing until we'd go to a microbiome conference and then everybody was doing the same stuff that we were doing. And so, um, so we, anyway, we wrote this book to talk about our personal journey and kind of the science in the field. And um, yeah, just to... Um, lay a foundation for people if they want to start thinking about these changes. And then, you know, in terms of um, kind of connecting with our research, certainly there's the Center for Human Microbiome Studies at Stanford, which is kind of our home base for doing a lot of these dietary interventions. We list the studies there, um, give more information on what we're doing. And then we have a lab website too that people can go to and read more about our research. Um, yeah, but um, we're, and we're always looking for participants for our studies. Great. Well, we will provide links to all of those sources. And I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us your knowledge for the incredible work that you and Erica, your wife and, and Chris do and, um, and are continuing to do. I think this is an area that, you know, when I started my training, I heard a little bit about um, microbiota and I always just thought those are people that work on infectious disease and like all the bad stuff. So it's, it's interesting and, and, really uh, important that people realize that, they, that we're carrying all this vital cargo and we need to take care of the cargo so it can take care of us. So thank you so much for your time and for the work you do. And I hope we can do it again. Thanks, Andrew. This was a great conversation. Terrific. Thank you for joining me today for my discussion with Dr. Justin Sonnenberg, all about the gut microbiome and how to optimize your gut microbiome for health. Please check out the Sonnenberg Lab webpage. That's Sonnenberg, spelled S-O-N-N-E-N-B-U-R-G-L-A-B dot Stanford dot E-D-U. That's Sonnenberg Lab dot Stanford dot E-D-U. They often recruit for studies exploring how different aspects of nutrition impact the gut microbiome, much as we discussed during today's episode. Please also check out the book that he and his wife, Dr. Erica Sonnenberg wrote called The Good Gut. It's readily available on all the usual sites such as Amazon and so forth. If you're learning from and are enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's a terrific zero cost way to support us. In addition, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple and Spotify. And on Apple, you have the opportunity to leave us up to a five-star review. You can also leave a comment on Apple if you like. The best place to leave us comments and feedback, however, is on our YouTube channel in the comments section. There you can suggest topics that you'd like us to cover in future episodes, guests that you'd like us to interview, and give us feedback about any of the material that you've heard or watched on this podcast. Please also check out the sponsors mentioned at the beginning of today's episode. That's the best way to support this podcast. We also have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash Andrew Huberman. And there you can support the podcast at any level that you like. On many episodes of the Huberman Lab podcast, including today, we discuss supplements. While supplements are certainly not necessary for everybody, many people derive tremendous benefit from them for things like sleep and focus, and indeed, gut microbiome support. The one issue with supplements, however, is that many of the supplement companies out there do not independently test their supplements, so there isn't tremendous confidence in all supplements that they contain the amounts of the ingredients that are listed on the bottle, 
and that the quality of the ingredients is where it should be. For that reason, we've partnered with Thorne. That's Thorne, T-H-O-R-N-E, because Thorne supplements are known to have the very highest levels of stringency with respect to the quality of the supplements and the amounts of the supplements listed on their bottles, lists what's actually in the containers, which is essential. If you'd like to see the Thorn supplements that I take, you can go to Thorn, T-H-O-R-N-E dot com slash the letter U slash Huberman, and you can get 20% off any of the Thorn supplements that are listed there. Also, if you navigate deeper into the Thorn site through that portal, thorn.com slash U slash Huberman, you can also get 20% off any of the other supplements that Thorn makes. If you're not already following Huberman Lab on Instagram and Twitter, please do so. There I cover topics about science and science-based tools, some of which overlap with the content of this podcast, much of which is separate and unique from the content of this podcast. We also have a newsletter. It is called the Neural Network Newsletter. Once a month, we put out short summaries of podcast episodes and key takeaways, actionable takeaways in particular. You can sign up for that by going to hubermanlab.com. You can look in the menu, look for Neural Network Newsletter. You can download previous newsletters to take a look at what those are like and about even before signing up. If you subscribe, we don't share your information with anybody. The privacy policy is made very clear at hubermanlab.com. So thank you once again for joining me for today's discussion about the gut microbiome. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for your interest in science. Mm -hmm.